Okay. Good morning. Good morning, Carroll County. It's uh again Commissioner Ed Rothstein, Thursday, August 26th. Can you believe the last week of August? Uh I feel like this summer has just flown by. Let's um start with as we always do, uh the Pledge of Allegiance and respect to our colors and take a moment of silence. Um, you know, for me, thinking about all those that are still in challenged ways coming out of Afghanistan and the hard work that our men and women are doing in protecting uh, those that are trying to uh, to get themselves to safety. Um, and there's a whole lot else going on, but that's in my thoughts. So with that, let's stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you. And it seems like there are a lot of heavy hearts of things going on from COVID-19, the storms, the flooding in Tennessee, and all the activity in Afghanistan. None of it should have to do with politics in my view. And uh, I'm actually gonna start off with Priority Carol this morning. Uh, first, um, a bit of an apology that we are virtual as opposed to in person, but we're doing this out of the abundance um, of caution and being guarded. Uh, it was in the newspaper and we were notified that a few members of Governor Hogan's team um, tested positive for COVID-19 while they were in Ocean City during the time we were at the uh, Maryland Association of Counties uh, summertime conference. With all of that said, uh, getting ourselves um, appropriately uh, tested and uh, separating ourselves, wearing the masks when necessary uh, is the right thing to do. And um, as always, that's what we try to uh, accomplish here. So an apology for not being in person, but um, it doesn't stop us from conducting and having the responsibilities we have in uh, running an open session meeting. After open session, we will be going into close for some land acquisition. Um, as far as uh, my priorities, that conference to me was unbelievable. Uh, we were able to not just procure, but to um, uh, move forward with the Department of the VA in Maryland for a hundred, $170 million project. It was 86 million. It's a $170 million project uh, that will be in Carroll County for 128 beds for our veterans. Um, everything from dialysis to full care to independent living. Uh, it will be the second home in, in uh, Maryland, but it definitely will be state of the art. And uh, really, really proud of our team. Uh, you know, in citizen services and everything we do uh, for our veterans, because that's what matters. It's focused on our veterans. And um, uh, Secretary Owings and the Deputy Secretary Finn um, just highlighted the uh, positive work we are doing for our veterans from transportation to support of uh, our veterans um, and uh, the Veterans Council. We had other meetings with uh, different actuals, uh, from the governor's administration. Uh, others may wanna highlight it, uh, but I will share that um, I was impressed with our uh, county team. There's about 14 of us total that were down there. And uh, you know, the, the work they talked about with commerce uh, is just unbelievable. And what we're bringing in uh, to, um, you know, we were able to uh, talk transportation and meet with uh, the <coughs> department transportation team excuse me, uh, was just some uh, great work. So it really highlighted <coughs> uh, the value of um, MAKO and the importance of collaboration that we were able to accomplish 
football down there. Um, the only other thing I just want to share very quickly again is Afghanistan. To me, uh, there's a lot of uh, comments out there um, as shared by some of my colleagues, social media and Facebook can be a cesspool of information and uh, you know, people providing opinions, hiding behind keyboards. This is not political in my view. It is about uh, the safety and security of uh, getting folks out of there um, that are American, but also that have served side by side uh, or in Afghan Shona Bishona, um, you know, working with each other uh, and getting them into uh, out of harm's way into safety. So please keep your thoughts uh, for strength and courage of those that are trying to exit Afghanistan. Um, with that, let me turn it over to District 1 and Commissioner Wentz. Going in order this morning. Very good. And I will follow up with that and say if anybody has uh, an opinion or a negative opinion or what have you and would like the real information, contact our county commissioner, uh, Colonel Ed Rothstein. Get off your stupid keyboards and talk to somebody that's lived it. So good morning, Carroll County. Um, it's, it's good to be with you, even though it's virtual. We're so used to this, man, we can do it on the fly now. So kudos to everybody that put this together. Uh, yeah, we had a little issue down there, apparently. Uh, I don't believe, uh, fingers crossed that uh, none of our folks uh, were directly affected. Um, the, the experience down there and the, uh, the things that were accomplished um, were again priceless and I, you know you all know how I feel about Mako. I've had the privilege to, to represent Carol on that board of directors for several years now. So uh, great meetings, great educational opportunities. The networking was tremendous. And um, I think uh, we're gonna see some great benefits as uh, Commissioner Rothstein says, as a result of some of the things we did. We met with the Department of Transportation, uh, met with uh, general services. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, I did see the beach at one point when I walked past the balcony of the room uh, that I was in, and it was there. I, I can I can I can report that the beach apparently is there, still there. So uh, if you get a chance, get down there and enjoy what is going to be the last of summer here. Good grief, you're right. Uh, at the end of August, what happened? A uh, few quick things for me. Uh, we haven't met since, uh, but I want to give a, a huge shout out to the individuals that joined me to pay tribute to the fallen firefighter in Frederick County. I was honored to be joined by our Director of Public Safety, Scott Campbell, uh, Sheriff Jim DeWeese, and Major Stem. The four of us represented Carroll. Um, it was an incredibly emotional uh, experience. As most of you know, I've lived that life as well. Uh, I had the pleasure of sitting uh, beside the president of the Frederick County Council and the governor and the county executive of Frederick, Frederick were to my right. So uh, incredibly honored to be there and uh, remember to keep those folks there in your thoughts and prayers. That never gets easy. Uh, we had a planning commission meeting last Tuesday before uh, MACO. Uh, that went very well. Uh, there's a lot happening in our county and a special thanks to those that continue to serve on our boards and commissions. I had the, uh, the pleasure of welcoming our new member, Matt Huff, to planning and zoning. That's the first opportunity I've had to do that. Very fine young gentleman who uh, knows our ag very well. So it's, a, it's good to have him on board. And then finally for me, uh, I was in a Governor's Emergency Management Advisory Council uh, uh, just Monday. And uh, just a reminder that emergency management has really stepped up now in our state. Uh, it is now a cabinet level position as of October the 1st. And that's huge for our state of Maryland to have our uh, emergency manager sitting directly on the governor's cabinet. That's gonna bring benefits to uh, the issues that we have and the challenges when emergencies occur. So kudos to our state legislators for seeing the importance of that and actually passing something for a change that was a positive 
for our state of Maryland. So thank you very much for that. Everybody continue to stay safe. Baby, it's hot outside. Uh, cooling stations are open. Uh, make sure that you check on uh, everyone that needs to be checked on. It's going to be hot for a while, and those thunderstorms are going to be rolling. Public safety, folks. Thank you, Commissioner Rothstein. Hey, one last thing is um, the gentleman was uh, posthumously promoted, correct, to uh, battalion chief? Yes, sir, that's, that's correct. Uh, Joshua Laird was promoted from captain to battalion chief, which was an honorable and uh, I got to tell you, first class action taken uh, by Frederick County. So keep the Laird family uh, in your thoughts. They're not that far away. Uh, those folks live in Fairfield, which is a hop, skip, and a jump from the northern part of the district, District 1. So thanks. Thank you, Ed. Yep, thanks for sharing. And from the, the great district number two of Finksburg and Gamber, the one, the only, Commissioner Weaver. Well, thank you for the introduction there. Um, I, I do want to say, uh, Mako, I think this is the most productive I've ever seen. It. We actually met, and, and uh, Commissioner Rosting uh, alluded to, uh, with the Veterans Council. We met it with MDOT, uh, General Services, and talked to a lot of people. Uh, but one of the things I'm trying to put my head around dollars and cents and it's close to $200 million that we're probably bringing back to Carroll uh, now and in the future. Just talking with MDOT, all of our uh, projects and where they are, uh, coordinating that with them in our futures, making them aware of things that they weren't even aware of yet that will come down the road is valuable to us. But one area I want to really emphasize is the um, met with uh, Secretary Churchill and uh, Tom Jones, Deputy Director, of general services, our nonprofits out here, they have computers, they have buses, they have vehicles, they, almost anything you want uh, from the federal government given to them that we can access. Uh, it's basically free of charge. We have to have the contact information. If it's a nonprofit and you need any of these items, uh, the computers have been cleaned up, they're ready to go, you have to program them. Uh, anything that a, a nonprofit needs, uh, I think we need to uh, get in contact with general services and access a lot of this material. I was totally, uh, not totally unaware, but uh, you forget about the availability of some of these things for a lot of our nonprofits. And uh, it is out there. We just have to, you know, contact myself, one of the commissioners will get, uh, help you get in contact with these people to uh, get the things you need. And, you know, Maryland open for business. I know Commissioner Wance was big on the hand sanitizers the whole time. Uh, but uh, Commissioner Wance, I have mine. I used it. I have several of them uh, use, in use. And uh, we tried to be as safe as possible while we were there. And you're right. The beach was, uh, I think, was still there. But uh, our focus was not there. We were in the uh, meetings all the time. And I, I just want to allude one other fact, I went to a lot of sessions. I know Commissioner Fraser was in one with me, and uh, they were, particularly with Howard and Baltimore County and development and things. We are so far ahead in what we're doing. I think when you look and compare to what other counties are doing, we are way out front, and we don't see it until we get hear these presentations from other counties, and you're thinking, well, we, we did that five years ago. Uh, we're ahead of this, and um, I think I think we've done a great job of uh, communicating with the state, uh, meeting with the secretaries, meeting with the governor, meeting with everybody uh, to get things done. And as I said before, we get more done in three days there than we do in three years here uh, without going to those meetings. So it's uh, really sitting down one-on-one -on -one with each of these people, talking to them, and if we don't have an answer, we can get it. It's probably just next door. So uh, it is extremely valuable. Okay, I think that uh, hand sanitizer, the first was used by Commissioner Wentz, thinking it was uh, for his uh, mouth freshener and, uh, you know, quickly learned. But um, the man who needs no introduction, the one the only, Commissioner Frazier. Thank you, Commissioner Rothstein. I appreciate that. 
True as it is. No. I, I don't know what else I can say about Mako. Well worth it. We met with all the agencies. And what, what I like about it, like especially no matter what agency you meet with, you bring up a concern within a couple of weeks or a month when we get back here. We get a text or an email saying this, you know, we looked into this. This is what's going on. So things actually happen. That, uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I just, and the, I, what I do a lot of is I'm walking around at, at different uh, things that are going on in Mako. You meet people in the hallway, they're from different county. How are you doing this? How are you doing that? What do you guys do for this and that? And you get a lot of different information from other counties that way, directly from the people that are involved with it. It's just so useful so helpful. I don't want to prolong it. We've already talked about Mako. Well worth it. I like being down there. I like the the, uh, the back and forth, the synergy you get when you're actually meeting people face to face and face to face and talking to them about things that we can improve with with the county. Although they're mostly they're asking us how we do it because we're like as previously mentioned, we're re really ahead of the other counties in most things. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And bringing up the south and the west, Commissioner Boucher. Thank you, Commissioner Rawlston. I want to start off by expressing my sincere gratitude and appreciation to Commissioner Lance and the delegation that went to Frederick County. I know how big of a brotherhood this is for all those firefighters and EMS technicians out there. And when they have a loss like this, it affects every one of them. And every one of their spouses and significant and others feel that impact too, because they know every day when their, their loved one goes out that they face this opportunity. So I want to express my sincere appreciation to Commissioner Lance and all of those who went out there. I know how important this is. For you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I also want to share my appreciation to Commissioner Rothstein for his leadership with Veteran Affairs. Carroll County is extremely fortunate to have a retired Colonel on this commission fighting for our veterans in their county. I believe the other week he expressed how many veterans reside in this county. So this is a very important issue because of his leadership we're getting the resources brought back into our county. So sincerely grateful for that. Thank you. I want to state that we have a couple new hirees in the county. I like doing this to welcome people on. We have Fred Lawson from Roads and Operations. Welcome aboard. And Stephen Blackwell with the Liquor Board. Uh, Mr. Swam, do you have any slides or, or photos of what we've been up to or I've been up to? I don't know what he has coming up first. Here we go. I went to an Eagle Scout ceremony. And as my colleagues know, this is probably one of the best things and happiest things we do as county commissioners. With me there is on the left, Garrett Kemp, and on the right, Edison Heller. These fine young men complete their Eagle Scout programs. They represent the future of our county. They learn leadership and character building. Um, Mr. Kemp on the left, his project was replacing a sidewalk between the church and the community hall. He's seen those cracked sidewalk and that elderly patrons are tripping on it. His father who does that type of work helped mentor him and show him how to do it and they replace the sidewalk. So it was very admirable of him. And Edison Heller on the right side helped fabricate a furnace for burning and disposing of flags. And he recognized the need that when they did their ceremonies that their existing system was a lot of smoke and it was hitting all the patrons from the ceremony. So he made like a, a furnace with a big high uh, chimney on it to prevent the smoke from um, hitting the patrons witnessing the ceremony. So thank you to those two gentlemen. Uh, what else might have, uh, here we go. We have on the left, our facilities bureau chief, Justin McGonnell on the right, our deputy director, Jason Green. They are on top of the county office building. We'll be reviewing this later, but like your house, it needs continual maintenance. These gentlemen were involved in inspection, keeping an eye on this building. I know that all of us walk into this building and we don't really look up and see things, but once they gave me the tour, I realized there's cracked concrete on our building, splits in the blocks, spacious getting mold in it, deterioration and rust. So they'll be presenting today, a program to, to do the maintenance on our building and make the investment. And as my father always told me years ago, it's so critical to maintain buildings because if you let a little leak go, eventually it costs you a lot more money. So we owe a lot of gratitude to these gentlemen and our staff to keep an eye on this so that we can fund these projects and maintain our buildings. So thank you to them. And I want to real quickly mention that summer is coming to an end and we're getting ready for the fall. So out at Piney Run Park, they will have wagon rides and campfires. <coughs> excuse me, beginning Friday, September 3rd, running through the month of October, every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evening. 
you can go out to Piney Run, you can get a uh, hayride with your family and friends, and they also have the campfires. So please get out there and patronize that. It's a fun time family. And also on September 12th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at Crimgold Park, they will be having the Out of the Darkness Carroll County Maryland Walk, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. I have helped sponsor this the last several years. I'll be out there walking. They'll do the, the walking and release phases throughout the day so everyone's not walking at once. So this has affected so many of our lives. Please get out there and support this. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. And uh, just lastly, again, appreciation to our staff um, and our, especially our senior staff that attended uh, MAKO with us, getting folks like uh, Celine Steckel in front of Secretary Owings and saying this is why um, the veteran services matter here in Carroll County and you know the the collaboration that we are we are doing with the state um, she hit a grand slam and then he pulls out his Gibbs phone and starts talking to whoever so I mean that's Secretary Owings but then uh, Jeff Castaway attending MDOT and DGS with us was so important uh, Roberta being there every step of the way um, so just you know I don't know I, I feel like we've got an A plus team. Uh, Jack Lyburn, there's only one of him, and I think they broke the mold, and that's not a bad thing either. So, uh, but his work that he did and shared with uh, Secretary Schultz was wonderful. Okay, enough stalling. I don't know where Commissioner Wance is, but let's go on to the uh, first item, and that is exterior envelope repairs and maintenance at the county office building. And... Who do we have? Okay. Dad, go for it. Oh. Who's starting? Eli? Uh, I can start. Yeah. Good, good morning. Uh, the Office of Procurement in cooperation with Bureau of Facilities requests your approval to complete repairs, maintenance, and replacement to the exterior envelope systems at the Carroll County Office Building using contractor Garland DBS Inc in the amount of $1,045,986. Garland DBS Inc. was awarded a competitively bid contract PW1925 from Omnia Partners. Apex Construction of Silver Spring, Maryland, an authorized agent of Garland DBS Inc. will perform the work. This amount is in the adopted FY22 budget and no additional funds will be needed. Good morning, commissioners. The county office building was constructed in 1973 with an addition in 1997. The building's exterior envelope must be maintained in order to preserve, protect the integrity of the structure. After years of exposure to these elements, the envelope is failing, is in need of repair, maintenance, and or replacement of many areas to head off future or more expensive costly repairs. Uh, I'm gonna turn this over to facilities project manager, Thad Highlander who prepared a PowerPoint presentation. Please keep in mind, commissioners, through as we go through these slides, these are just a few pictures of all the, defic the defections in the building, which all need repaired, and they will get addressed during the scope of work. So with that, if you wanna take it from here and uh, explain what we got going on for the commissioners. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I'll make this short and sweet and kind of run through this very quickly to keep you on schedule. Uh, of course, the first slide, this is the building in question. If we could have the next one, if you don't mind. Uh, 1973, this side here was the first side constructed, and it was constructed uh, with a precast brick facade. Next slide, please. In 1997, the second side was completed, and this side here has an ephus and a brick facade. Next slide. The brick, uh, the, the precast is nothing more than concrete that resembles stone. And in between two pieces of precast, you have a control joint. This control joint fails, water gets back in there, it freezes, and like you see in the picture, it pops out the concrete. These areas will all be addressed. Uh, they will be repaired, and that control joint, uh, all the stuff will be removed out of it and re -caught. Next slide, please. Uh, the brick mortar, uh, course on both sides of the building develop cracks sometimes it's actually missing uh, but this will allow moisture to enter the building uh, these will all be cut out um, and removed 
new motor put in and this will be done the whole way around the building and that's referred to as point up. So the whole building will be pointed up, all bad areas removed and new mortar put in. Next slide. Uh, you notice the two white things hanging out of the holes in the building, these are weeps. Um, occasionally moisture gets in behind the bricks. These weeps allow that moisture to come back out. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the train of thought back in the day was these wicks uh, were a great idea. They did work. However, birds take these wicks for nesting material and leave just a hole in the brick. All these weeps uh, will be replaced uh, with a honeycomb material, which birds don't mess with. Uh, so that'll fix that and address that problem. Next slide, please. Uh, around the whole building, there are control joints uh, that allow a little bit of movement uh, so it doesn't crack the brick. These control joints are failing. Uh, also, there's uh, the, the, the material in there, like a caulk, is missing in places, which would allow moisture into the building. All these control joints will be cleaned, the old compound removed, and new caulk put in. Next slide, please. Uh, the building will also undergo a complete pressure washing, as you can see uh, how much dirt and grime is built up. And this is just one small section. Uh, it's continuous around the building, um, a lot of dirt and grime. But uh, so we're going to pressure wash the whole exterior of the building, basically uh, to make it look good, of course, but also when we get ready to seal the building, it has to have a clean, uh, clean service to adhere to. Next slide, please. Uh, this side of the building, uh, the 1997 side, newer side has an EFIS system, which is kind of comparable, uh, comparable to stucco. This EFIS system has failed uh, in a lot of areas. Um, what we're going to do is repair all this EFIS um, in the bad areas, and we're going to paint it to match the existing. Um, this is just one small section, but uh, around every window on the new side, uh, uh, the middle strip of the building is all EFIS, and you, you can see this, it looks like peeling paint, but that is actually the, uh, the base actually lifting off of the substrate, uh, which will allow a lot more water to enter and a lot more damage to occur. And this will all be resolved uh, while we're fixing the building envelope. Next slide. All penetrations to the building, whether it's pipes or electrical, um, Every penetration will be uh, cleaned and resealed. And I picked this one. This is not typical of every penetration. However, this is the worst one there is that's kind of open to the elements. And this will all be repaired during the scope of work. Next slide. This system here is the Manstrut, uh, better known as a windscreen that goes around the whole perimeter of the roof. Um, this system, um, Basically, you cannot see any of the rooftop equipment um, because of this particular windscreen. Uh, and that, that's what it's there for. It's to hide all the equipment on the roof and, and aesthetically make it look better. Uh, next slide. This manstrid uh, has metal on the front side, but underneath of it, it has plywood. This plywood is then attached to the substrate. The plywood is failing. Um, in many, many areas. Also, the screws that hold the plywood to the substrate, they're starting to rust. Um, our proposal is that we want to remove all of this metal, all of this plywood, and put new in. Next straight. Next slide, please. This is what the front looks like. It's a brown metal. This is a standing seam, basically metal design. And we will have all new standing seam roof around the whole perimeter. Um, brand new with no plywood behind the rot. That, that new metal will be attached directly to the substrate or, or the superstructure. Next slide. This is kind of underneath this manstrut or windscreen. There's about 12 foot section of roof. While this is removed, it's a ideal time to replace this roof and all the penetrations need to be reviewed and make sure they're watertight. And if they're not, they'll be fixed. But it's a real good opportunity to address this area why the master is, is off. So 12 foot of this all the way around the roof will be brand new roof and all the penetrations uh, will be resealed and fixed. Next slide. 
This is the substrate itself. It's angle iron. It's, uh, I wouldn't say it's in terrible shape, but it's not in the best of shape. It'll all be sanded down. It'll be grinded, uh, scraped. It'll be primed. Uh, I believe it'll at least also be pressure washed and then painted. Um, it's a real good 3M paint they're using, or um, that's a, uh, I'm sorry, it's a Rust-Oleum paint. I think it's a 20 year paint they're gonna put on there. It's almost like an epoxy. We should have no more problem with this for quite a few years. Next slide. And this is the last slide. And this is, uh, the fountain is right in front of this wall. This, we're also gonna address uh, the steps in this, this knee wall. We're gonna point it up, we're gonna clean it. And as you can see, there's some caulking compound in there that's not even what it should be, but we're gonna clean all this up and put it back to the original standards. So it's nice and pretty on the, the fountain. Not, not only pretty, but it's also holding all that dirt back uh, above those walls. Uh, so it's pretty uh, integral to the front of this building, and this will all be fixed under this proposal. And I believe that's the last slide. And if you have any questions, please ask them now. I think we're ready. Okay, I appreciate it. Great presentation. Any uh, questions, comments from the team? Wouldn't be possible to uh, put solar panels on those wind breaks, would it, instead of uh, just metal? We uh, talked about that um, in talking to Garland, and they did a little research on it. Didn't really go in depth, but they didn't think the money was going to be worth the uh, the juice would be worth the, worth the squeeze on this particular building. Because you're only going to get a quarter of the building with the sun, because that sun's going to set. And you're only going to pick up the morning sun or the evening sun. You want more of a flatter surface to pick up sun more 24 hours, of, well, 12 hours a day mostly is what you want. Okay, thank you. Well, I move that the Board of Commissioners approve the use of Garland DBS Inc. to complete the repairs, maintenance, and replacement of the exterior envelope system of the county office building in the amount of $1,045,986. Is Okay, I'll second. Is there uh, any further discussion on this one? Seeing here none, all in favor? Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Now let's move on to leasing some vehicles. Yeah, I'll get this started. The, uh, the Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management Warehouse Operations requests your approval to lease vehicles on an as-needed basis from Acme Auto Leasing LLC in the amount not to exceed $30,000 annually. This lease is being made through a HGAC contract that was competitively bid. Sufficient funds are available for this lease. Good morning, commissioners. Um, first, I'd like just a minute of your time because I have some fantastic news here. Uh, sitting with me for his first time in front of you and uh, first time on television, I think, here is Mr. Reed Oliver. Uh, Reed is our brand new um, Bureau Chief of Fleet Management and Warehouse Operations. Uh, real briefly, uh, we're lucky to have Reed. He came to work for us about three years ago after uh, some time in the private sector uh, where he worked for a dealership uh, and was managing uh, the quick lube portion of that dealership and the team they're in. Reed has his uh, associate's degree in automotive technology from uh, Community uh, College of Baltimore County, Catonsville campus. And he is almost completed uh, his bachelor's degree in human resources management. Um, he's just a couple classes short of that. And I will point out, um, that's m many thanks, and I know Reed would acknowledge, to our, our educational opportunities and programs here uh, run by our Department of Human Resources. So just wanted to take a minute, Commissioners, and introduce you to Reed. Okay, welcome on board, Reed, and uh, look forward to uh, the work you're going to be providing to Carroll County. Right. Go ahead, Reed. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say thank you, Doug, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity. And I'm looking forward to working with you guys in the future. 
And uh, now, commissioners, back to the topic at hand. Yes, these uh, these vehicles will allow us uh, within the Bureau of Fleet Management on an as-needed basis um, to be able to uh, uh, have the vehicles that we need when we need them. Uh, it's not often, but this does provide us with that flexibility, and we would certainly appreciate your approval on this item. Okay, okay. it's great. Commissioners approved the lease of vehicles on an as-needed basis at the cost of not to exceed $30,000 annually to Acme Leasing Company. Second. I got a motion, got a second. Anything to discuss? Any questions? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Okay, 5-0. Now let's talk about purchasing a couple of F-350s. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management Warehouse Operations requests your approval to purchase two 2022 Ford F-350 regular cab 4x4 with dump and plow from Apple Ford in the total amount of $110,523.04. This purchase is being made through a Baltimore County contract 0004504 that was competitively bid. This amount is in the adopted FY22 budget and no additional funds will be needed. Okay, so commissioners again, and as uh, Reed gets uh, his feet wet, I'm just going to lead on a couple of these. We are seeking your approval on this item. Uh, this item will replace uh, two vehicles currently utilized by the Bureau of Facilities. And um, one of the vehicles uh, that is being replaced is actually going to be repurposed to our staff at Carroll Community College. And the other vehicle that is being replaced uh, because of the amount of money that we have spent on it, um, which is in the tune of about $20,000 in its lifetime to repair it, uh, will be sent to auction. Uh, Justin is on and can give you uh, additional details as far as what they'll be used for in facilities. Justin. Yeah, hey, morning, commissioners. Uh, the two trucks uh, are going to be a daily use truck. Uh, we are going to supply these two trucks with dump beds, which is going to allow us the capabilities of in uh, summertime using these dump beds to deliver mulch to all the multiple sites throughout the college instead of hauling a big dump truck on truck on, or trailer, better fuel mileage. And also in the wintertime, we can use these dump beds for uh, salt applications in the parking lots, in a tight area parking lots. These uh, pickup trucks are a lot easier to maneuver in tight areas rather than a big five ton truck. So it's gonna be more practical for us on our day-to-day -day operations to get things done more efficient than uh, previously. I'll move the uh, Board of Commissioners approve the purchase of two uh, 2022 F-350 regular cab four by fours with dump body and plow to Apple Ford in the amount of $110,523.04. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second, and just share the importance of when we read these. One is the description, of course, but two is that this has been already put into our budget from FY22, so it's not outside of what we, you know, decided on our operational budget. Um, so we're not creating anything new um, because sometimes you look at these price tags and they're pretty high, but that's what planning, good planning does. So um, any comments, questions on this? Seeing, hearing none, all in favor? Okay, got five. Now let's talk about FY 2022 pavement testing and rehabilitation recommendations. Doug, good morning. Are you oh, Chris, go ahead. Good morning, Commissioner. Sorry about that. We're here today to seek your concurrence to utilize an existing bid term contract with Wood Environmental and Infrastructure Solutions Incorporated to evaluate and provide pavement testing and rehabilitation recommendations for approximately 39 miles of roadways in the amount of $124,903.53. These are the roadways we're planning for our FY22 pavement projects. And some of the work includes uh, visual condition surveys, non-destructive testing, pavement coring, material sampling, and subgrade soil classification. There'll be some laboratory testing of subgrade soils when needed, 
and then a final report uh, of our pavement rec rehabilitation recommendations will be provided. We received two proposals from our term contractors and Wood Infrastructure Solutions was the lowest pro pro proposal. We've utilized this firm for several years and we hope to have our final report in November. Are there any questions? Okay, any questions on this one? Okay, seems to be timing's everything. <laughs> uh, I'll move the Board of Commissioners approve Department of Public Works to use the term contract with Wood Environment and Infrastructure, Infrastructure Solutions Incorporated, an amount of $124,903.53. Second. Okay, got a motion. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Wentz. Yeah, so a couple questions, I guess, for me. Uh, and as we continue to see some of these roads get that surface put on them, uh, I've been getting an uptick in questions, I guess, from some of my constituents out there. Um, specifically, I guess, when it comes to, it, it appears like some of these uh, resurfacing projects, the, where the where the vehicles travel a lot, they seem to be getting shiny uh, and it looks like they're wearing uh, rapidly. I don't know. I mean, that's something for another time, I guess, but I just wanted to bring that up underneath of this because these folks look as to whether or not these roads are in need of that resurfacing. Is that correct, Chris? This specific project is we've already identified they need to be resurfaced. These are determining what our rehabilitation strategy should be. Are we gonna mill and fill? Are we gonna do full depth reclamation? Are we gonna just patch? What, what specifically are we gonna do? Um, we do have a, an asset management program, which we're in the middle of right now for this cycle to look at which roadways we will be um, putting in the next couple of years programs and which ones will follow those after that. So we are looking at every roadway every two years to determine what application, whether or not they need to be, you know, rehabilitated and when. Obviously, we can't do everything um, right away. Okay, I just uh, <laughs> you got you guys know I I, I do have a, a tremendous amount of respect for the way in which we evaluate our roadways and how they're done. I you know we've been here almost seven years now, so I get it. But I continue to question, you know, some of the things that we utilize and the, the I guess, the, the pace at which we resurface these roads. Um, because I continue to get the questions, well, you know, I, I, I know they need to be done so that they can be, that, that we can maintain them longer so that we don't have to repay them. But um, I, I still have issues, I guess, with some of the surfacing that we're using. So I'll get into that later on, but $124,000 to tell us what we have to do seems like a lot of money to me, uh, but I guess in the grand scheme of things, it, it's it's what we need to do. So just expressing a little bit of, of a challenge here. Uh, sure. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And Commissioner, it's it's well, your, your point's well taken. Uh, as Chris said, this this particular thing looks at not only what we see above the road, but it looks at what's below the road. So if we are having any challenges with the base, anything that's going to go over, and in this particular point, it is key to our preservation process. And I know that you all hear quite often on the treatments that we do, particularly the, the chip seal, you know, overlays when we do those as part of preservation. And they may, our customers may see that become shiny a little bit more because again, we actually rely on the traveling public to help make that program work. And as they drive over a chip sealed road, our goal is for them to drive, to continue all in time to drive the chip into the crack, drive it down into the surface and drive it into the wearing lane so that it does fill those cracks over time. And they may become a little bit more shiny, but as you always do, um, if you have anybody that wants any more specific detail, absolutely we'll reach out to them, uh, take them around, show them some some roads and, and go over the process with them because we, we certainly don't want anybody who doesn't understand what we're doing 
and we will be glad to help them out. And we always appreciate your questions because we know there are folks out there watching and, and uh, listening to, to what we're saying. Thanks, Doug. And thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Real quickly, I want to thank Commissioner Wayans for bringing this point up because it's important for public awareness. I have the same type of constituent calls. So thank you, Deputy Director Brown, for bringing this to people's attention. There's a process that goes through, and I think people initially don't understand it, but then as time goes on, they see what we're trying to accomplish. So thanks for bringing this up for the public awareness. Okay. I know we got a motion. Did I second or do we get a second on this? Commissioner Weaver okay. second. Okay. So we got a motion. We've had a second. Anything else? Further discussion? Sorry for losing the bubble on that. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Now let's talk about center line stripping uh, or striping, excuse me, of roadways after pavement management and pavement preservation. All right, thank you, Commissioner. I'm, I'm gonna lead off a bit on this one because actually uh, you all asked me a question uh, some months ago, many of you emailed. Um, when we started our projects earlier in the year, I was getting many emails from our customers and, and you commissioners on when are you guys gonna put lines on those roads? And uh, we had a brief discussion with you earlier that there was a nationwide shortage of traffic paint, uh, particularly in the yellow colors. So we've prepared a brief for you today and we are asking your consideration uh, to allow us to continue on with what we need to do. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and then I've got Jim here standing by in case you have any other questions about our striping program. Chris. Thank you. And uh, this scarcity of uh, centerline yellow, yellow paint it uh, stems large in part from a shortage of an obscure chemical compound. I won't go into the name because it's more than I can pronounce. Um, it's one of the key ingredients that goes in this yellow paint. Um, a major producer of the compound um, had production problems last year in Texas as part of their um, cooler weather than they normally have there in Texas. Um, so a lot of people scaled back of their production of the yellow paint because they didn't have this, this compound. So as we were getting through into our pavement management and our pavement preservation projects, uh, we didn't want to hold those up and not do those. So we explored other options for sources of paint, other vendors than we normally use, other suppliers. And we were able to engage our pavement management contractor um, who found a subcontractor to, that, that had paint. Um, they had, I guess, stockpiled a good bit of paint and uh, they were able to center line stripe uh, 36 and a quarter miles of roadway um, already. And we have another 13 miles of roadway that uh, we are ready for them to come. They are delayed because of the rain last week. Um, so we ex estimate the total cost of this would be approximately $110,500 for a total of about 50 miles of center line roadway. I'm assuming this was not budgeted. Not, not in this fashion. We will be utilizing pavement management, pavement preservation dollars that are in the FY21 uh, capital budget to utilize, to do this. Um, so it's, we're not going, we're not looking for money from one of the unallocated funds, we are gonna use existing dollars within the pavement management, pavement preservation budgets to accomplish this work. We, we allocated quite a bit of uh, money for paint here a few months ago. Uh, what happens when that paint comes in now? Sure, thanks commissioner. Um, <clears throat> So absolutely, the way the process went, as you know, every year we, we go out and restripe our roadways, particularly we focus on the center lines because we want we don't want people crossing them, getting in the middle, getting confused and uh, creating more accidents. Um, we had already begun before we saw you on that first time, uh, before we knew there was a shortage and actually had run out of last fiscal year's paint. And then we came in to you and we got this fiscal year's paint approved. We immediately placed the order that you speak of and they have now told us to stop calling. They don't know when they'll have it. When they have it, they have it, and they'll send it to us. But we are only doing roads that are overlaid and made black that we are forced to do. So these are roads that are part of our payment preservation 
that we have to do when the weather's good, when construction's going on, or we would be a full year behind. So that is all that this contractor's doing. When we get that paint, uh, we will stock it. And as the weather is good, we will continue on with our program and do our remaining roads that we ourselves were not able to complete because it is very important for us to keep up with that cycle, both on the yellow and the white. Now, I don't have an issue with moving money from one to another uh, if it's appropriate. I think the question is how much is in the pavement um, preservation, you know, fund right now? I mean, is this going to drop us to, to what? Go ahead, Chris. No, we have sufficient funding in both those projects to cover these costs. What would the normal cost of this be if we didn't have to go to the outside person to get this done? What would we normally pay to have this 50 miles striped? We would pay material material costs are the only things that the county took. We own a, we own the truck, so there's normal maintenance and things, but material costs would be around ten thousand dollars in material costs. Right. To, cost that, to put it down a uh, cost, total cost for us to Scrape them up. Jim, do you have uh, what's the what's the labor and men, Jim, for uh, for that truck? Rough rough um, estimate per mile. It's 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 approximately eight gallons per mile, and uh, one we have one tote that does uh, thirty two miles. Um, I don't have the exact figure on the cost of it, but uh, usually we can do that tote. And, one tote in in a day's time so it's like 32 miles in one day's time and how and many of our team are on that for labor that's um four people all together with with that we have a, a two trucks one's a supply truck one's a pilot truck and the other is the paint truck itself so there's four four uh employees all together all right, so Doug, what does that add up to if it was uh, in-house, roughly? I'm going to say in a, in a quick estimate, we're probably looking to do um, the, the tote at about $20,000 $20, with labor. So this is $90,000 over, well, 80000 with supplies over, correct? Using yes. CDMA. Yeah, I mean, wow. it certainly is more expensive, which is why we yeah. normally do our own. Yeah. Um, and, and we wouldn't be here before you if we could get our paint. But we have tried every vendor uh, from Duran to you name a paint company, and no one has this paint. And simply because no one has the obscure chemical that Chris is speaking to, um, we just we have no way to get it. And the only way we have right now, it's supply and demand. This particular vendor who all they do is painting stockpiled a huge amount of paint before this, and they're not selling it. The only way you're getting it is if they put it down. And uh, that's that's kind of where we're at. Was uh, CJ Miller, was that a uh, competitive bid process? So their pavement management was competitively bid. Um, we did get another price from another vendor um, which was significantly higher than this price. Um, so they were, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. Definitely, it's a supply and demand. Um, and uh, we felt that the price that we got was reasonable for the conditions and the timing. Um, and we were only doing the roadways that did not have any type of line on them so that we could at least get a center line on the roadway. Uh, our crews do have white paint, so they were putting... They're following up. Uh, our crews also mark the roadways ahead of time to reduce the cost. Um, and then they're putting the white lines on the road uh, once the center lines on the road. You have a motion yet, Commissioner Rothstein? I have not had a motion yet. All right, I'm gonna make this motion, but I'm gonna make it with a couple stipulations here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't want this to become a habit uh, I, I hope that our department continues to go after this paint. Somebody's getting the paint. A lot of things are starting to come back now. Uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to get, into, when, if we've got the, the personnel and equipment to be able to do this, 
I don't want this to become a habit. But if we can't get it in the interim, this is a public safety issue because there's no double yellow line on, uh, on one of the roads that I travel heavily, and that road needs a double yellow line like yesterday. Uh, so that's there's there's my thoughts on it. Um, we, that paint's got to be coming available soon. I hope you all keep going after it. I'll move that we approve the change order uh, to use C.J. Miller LLC for the striping, one hundred and ten thousand five hundred. Second. Hit the wrong button. But then again, I have a face for radio, so that's not too bad. I got a motion in a couple seconds, uh, and I agree. This is about safety, so or that this gets done. Any other discussion, comments? Seeing here none, all in favor? Okay, five. Let's move on to seeking approval to use term contract for construction of head walls on new pipe installation between uh, 5701 and 5639 Bethel Road down in Woodbine. Perfect. Well, you laid it out, Commissioner, and I'm going to let Jim go into the details for you. Jim. Uh, we we installed this pipe. It's a, it's a huge pipe, 60-inch pipe. Um, it was required head walls. The head walls Three KS head walls are too heavy for anything that we have, any equipment that we have. We, it requires a crane to set them. And so this is one reason we decided to, to ask for a, a contractor to, to uh, install these head walls. And um, the, in, in, if, in all the future work that we're doing, it's re being required that we put head walls on any pipe installation that we uh any any pipes that we install in the future so this is uh in, an environmentally um topic that is that, that we're trying to address keeps the erosion down and it's it's um it's essential to these new installations so this this particular one is a it's a a heavy head wall that like i said requires a, a crane to install it and we don't have that type of equipment, you know, without contracting it out. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Would you or, or Deputy Director Brown have a, a photo or example of what would be installed so people can visualize and get a con concept of what we're go going to be doing? I can, uh, I can bring one up. Um, if Chris can give me the ability to uh, show it to you, certainly. Also, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like to have a little tour of this when a project takes place. Mr. Lenochin took me up in the Commissioner Wance's district a couple months ago and showed me some of these culvert reconstructions. And I like getting photos of the construction, what's going on to, to keep her constituents informed. So, apologize, uh, but on short notice, uh, what I'm bringing up for you is the example of what a concrete head wall uh, would would look like. And uh, these are the large pictures of a variety of different kinds. Typically, the concrete head wall uh, is installed around either end of the pipe. And as you can see here, and I will example, um, you can imagine that if a pipe, if this pipe were installed uh, without a head wall, then the potential is that water coming again from either direction, inflow or outflow, will wash around the pipe uh, in all directions and potentially wash downstream. The head wall is designed to both direct the water and prevent the water from going around the pipe, but it directs it into the pipe and also picks it up. And then typically all of these installations, uh, depending again upon where they're at, uh, you will have some heavy-duty reinforcement in the form of gabion or large stone uh, around the input or in intake sides of the head wall. And again, the head wall provides a much more stable environment uh, for the pipe and a longer-lasting pipe installation that will deal with heavy downfall, uh, floods, and the like uh, when streams are there. So I hope that's answered your question. 
Yes, I appreciate that. And, and I like you emphasize the fact that will increase the longevity and life of the existing work in place. So in the long run, it will save us money. I move that the Board of Commissioners approve the Bureau of Roads Operations to use HTI contractors to construct headwalls on the existing HDP pipe located between 5701 and 5639 Bethel Road in Woodbine, Maryland for $36,395. Second. Okay, got a motion to second. Any further discussion or any questions? Seeing here none, all in favor? Okay, we got five. Okay, Doug, you're out of the hot seat. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank again. you all. Have a great day. I believe, Celine, you're coming on to get us money and not use ours. And we're going to talk about the calendar year 22 Family Self-Sufficiency Grant Application and Award. Um, and I think you're on. So okay. Who wants to start? All right, great. Good morning, commissioners. I'm here this morning with Danielle Yates, our Bureau Chief of Housing and Community Connections. Um, Corey Hardinger is with us from the Grants Office. She's our Grants Analyst. And Carol Smith, our Program Coordinator of the Family Self-Sufficiency Program, also known as Thrive. Uh, we are here seeking approval to submit application and award acceptance for this calendar year 22 Self-Sufficiency Program grant. We've administered this grant, this program since 1996, and it is really a fantastic program that allows people an opportunity, um, individuals with housing choice vouchers, an opportunity to achieve economic self-sufficiency by providing support services through this program coordination. And Carol does an excellent job doing that. Um, we are here requesting $79,440 um, through this grant which will be used to support the salary and fringe of the program coordinator position. I'm going to turn it over to Danielle Yates so she can describe how the funding is a little different this year on a positive note, um, the opportunity that we're seeking this year and how that differs a little bit from past years. Good morning, commissioners. Um, so I'll briefly tell you about the family self-sufficiency program first. So it is a voluntary program as Celine mentioned. This is offered to all of our housing choice voucher recipients. Family Self-Sufficiency Program Coordinator works with the participants to create individual goals to focus on each family's needs. Through the community partnerships, the Family Self-Sufficiency Program Coordinator creates, they're able to link individuals to services that will assist the family in attaining their goals of becoming more economically self-sufficient. Our agency has created strong partnerships with other surrounding agencies, such as BERC, HSP, DSS, the Health Department, United Way, Carroll Community College, Carroll County Youth Service Bureau, Potomac Case Management, and many others. Historically, approximately 85% of our participants will attend college or receive a vocational training, and approximately 60% of our participants will no longer receive a housing subsidy assistance once they graduate from the program. We have had success in having over 25 graduates actually purchase homes once they have successfully succeeded in um, accomplishing the, the self-sufficiency program. Um, as Celine had mentioned, this year we have actually um, had the opportunity to um, apply for additional funding. For the past two years, we have been flat funded at $62,481. This year, we are able to request um, reimbursement for the full amount of the cost for our housing, our family self-sufficiency program coordinator in the amount of $79,040. Um, if by some chance the additional funding wasn't there, we still have the additional housing administrative funds that cover everything. So no county dollars are required at all for this position or this program. Um, I would like to turn it over now to Carol Smith. Um, so she can share just a few highlights from this past year with some of our recipients. Good morning, commissioners. I'm really happy to share with you what's been happening with our participant families in the last year. We served 32 families last year and currently have 25 participants. Out of the 25, 23 have escrow accounts. And that means that 92% saw their earned income increase after they joined the program and started working on personal goals like vocational training 
and additional education to improve their employment situation. We start an escrow account for them with HUD funds when their rent portion goes up from an increase in earned income and the HUD subsidy goes down. So even with the challenges of COVID in the last year and a half, since August, there have been three graduations with escrow awards. We were really excited earlier this year when the largest escrow in the history of the county's FSS program was awarded. The participant who got this was on the program for five years and ended up with a total escrow of $45,000, which is HUD funds. And they were, with this money, able to purchase a car to attend school that was out of county. And after that, they maintained full-time employment in the healthcare field for two years. They then graduated from the program early this year and received the balance of the escrow of $32,000. And that put them in a better position to buy a house. Although the family still qualifies for housing assistance, it, has, it is at a greatly reduced level and they plan to eventually relinquish their voucher and buy a home. Another participant in the program has had an eight-fold increase in earned income since joining the program. And this brought her to the point this spring where she was able to pay her entire rent. She graduated from the program a year early, received an escrow of $23,000, and no longer receives any housing assistance. So her voucher has now been freed up for another county family. Three more participants will be graduating before the end of the year, having successfully reached all of their personal goals, as well as HUD's goal of being suitably employed. Goals typically include vocational training, financial education, credit repair, and addressing health needs. So in spite of the challenges of the last year and a half, FSS participants have continued to make progress and they have been greatly aided by government agencies and local nonprofits that really rose to the occasion to meet the increased needs in the community since COVID challenges. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you so much, Carol, and uh, for the rundown. Any questions or comments? Um, I will just share, uh, Celine, you're, you're beaming with pride. You've got a rock star team and it shows. And uh, again, thank you for all you did down in uh, down Mako um, for all you're doing for our veterans in our community, but uh, you, it just shows. Um, and I just wanna say thanks. And with that, I'll move that the Board of Commissioners approve the submission of the calendar year 22 family self-sufficiency grant renewal application and accept the uh, award. And thank you so much, uh, Carol, um, Danielle and Corey for sharing with us this morning. Thank you. Second. Okay. Not sure why there was such a delay on the second, but I'll take that as confidence. So I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on this great program all in favor okay we got five thank you ladies thank, thank you commissioners you. okay now we have the one the only chief administrator to talk to us about the organization design and compensation study go ahead commissioner Boucher. thank you sir if i may I'd like to request that this item be moved to the end of the agenda for two reasons. One, I had requested months ago to review the budget process for the public and have some potential reform that would be attached to that. And I think that was requested months ago before this. And the second thing is I have some legal language supplied to me by the county attorney, which will be presented during the budget presentation, which could potentially affect this. So if it's okay with my colleagues, can we move this item on the agenda to become the last item on the agenda? 
Okay. Um, I wish this was brought up early. So because these agendas are shared with the community so they know what's coming, um, you know, in the order that they, that, that we put them out. Uh, I'm, I'm personally okay with that. Uh, a slight, a slight foul, but um, my apologies. This uh, this topic exactly is so, uh, and, and that's that's fine. Um, uh, you know, others, any comments? I mean, again, it's it's a a bit unorthodox, but you know, if that's a concern that you have, uh, in respecting it, I don't have an issue with it. Are there any? Comments on that? Uh, yeah, I would like the opinion of the county attorney on a possible open meetings violation. Yep. Thanks. Oh, I'll get him. He may not be listening right at the moment. Oh, there he is. I'm, I'm sorry. Could you re uh, repeat that? Hey, okay, Tim. So just to, to package this, uh, we're on item to discuss organization design and compensation study where the administrator was going to brief us and it was brought up by Commissioner Boucher to request that this item be pushed to the end of our agenda uh, till you know the last item um, at this moment. And I mentioned that it, I feel it's unorthodox, but I don't have an issue, but Commissioner Wance brought it up and wants a an opinion from you uh, regarding uh, open meetings, potential open meetings violation. Did I capture uh, everything? Yes, uh, there would be no no violation of the Open Meetings Act. This was on the agenda. Uh, it was a public notice was provided to the members of the general public. So there would be no open meetings violation if we take this up a little later today. Okay, that, that was pretty direct. Um, Commissioner Wentz? I'm, I'm fine then. Okay. Uh, the open meetings is incredibly important. Yeah. And uh, my colleague always likes to reference legal uh, information. And I'm right back at him. I want to make sure we're, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Okay. So we got three. Uh, Commissioner Weaver, Frazier, any concern issue? Okay. Let's move on. Uh, to the next item, which is getting approval of the fiscal year 22 town county agreement, Mount Airy. I believe Mr. Zaleski, you're up. Okay, I believe this is the next to last one for this year, town of Mount Airy. The net amount that will go to them, as we've discussed, you know, after the revenue sharing minus the MPDS costs that they pick up is $199,039. Just need a motion for you to approve and we will send them their check. That's pretty straightforward. I move the Board of Commissioners approve the FY22 Town County Agreement with the Town of Mount Area. Second. Got a motion to second. Any discussion or questions for uh, Mr. Zaleski? Seeing here none, all in favor? Okay, let's move on. County budget process presentation. I got both uh, Mr. Zaleski and Rob Burke. Is Rob coming on for this? There he is. Okay, Mr. Burke, our comptroller, and Mr. Zaleski. I believe Rob is going to go first. Okay. Okay. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I asked to uh, address the board and the public uh, a bit on some of the financial processes and, and how they tie in with the budget process, uh, the audit process, the financial reporting, a little bit of the whole uh, financial cycle of, uh, you know, of how everything ties in together. Uh, through the Department of the Comptroller, along with the Department of Management and Budget to uh, address uh, all financial 
you know, processes for the county. Um, specifically, it sounds like the focus is going to be on the budget process. So uh, I think I'll just lay out a few things of the way that process affects uh, my operation in the, in the, in the financial area um, and the way that the, uh, again, the budget kind of ties into uh, how we do our financial reporting and year-end uh, audit issues. So uh, just a few things, uh, thoughts that I like to uh, share when I'm discussing how the budget affects uh, the finances and the things that we present. Uh, obviously, and I'll let Ted, you know, go more into the idea the budget's a financial planning tool, um, obviously uh, important in uh, allocating resources to the various uh, agencies that we fund. Uh, the uh, revenue estimates are very important in how we plan and how the board uh, allocates dollars and uh, sets the uh, course for the county spending. The piece that's sometimes uh, not as clear to the uh, to the public is that the budget itself is a, a legal document. It, it establishes spending authority, uh, both uh, for the board, for the county government uh, in total, uh, and then uh, through the board's designated authority to the directors uh, to oversee their budgets and their spending. So uh, a lot of the financial controls that, that my area overseas as we're dispersing funds and working with the agencies looks back to the budget as the adopted spending authority and making sure we're staying within that for legal purposes as well as for a good best practice with financial management. So the, the most important interchange between the budget, the budget process and how we carry out the day-to-day -day activities and the spending is that legal authority, making sure that it uh, is in place and that we're staying within that legal authority. Uh, again, those financial controls, budget approvals required on the majority of spending requests that come from the agencies to request uh, disbursements out of the county checkbook on a day-to-day -day basis. So the requisitions for um, you know, services, uh, for commodities, things that'll flow through purchasing, uh, the voucher payments that come through in the form of paying the county bills we're usually uh, tying back to the budget, to the proper coding, the proper uh, way that we're tracking. It's also important for the agencies to be able to see and track their budget their, through the year, whether they're on track, whether we're uh, going to you know, come up with any surplus or come up short and be able to bring that early to the year of budget and to the board. Uh, of course, uh, board concurrence is the uh, primary control of the, of the larger dollars that we spend. The, uh, board, um, the state law sets the uh, bid limit at $25,000, and the board has also set the delegation of authority at about at $25,000 for county uh, staff. So, uh, you know, most of the day-to-day -day smaller activity that's happening on procurement cards and paying our bills, you know, doesn't come before the board, but the large items, obviously, over $25,000 uh, come before the board uh, either at the beginning in order to award the contract or at the time uh, that a project's ready to uh, move forward, spend you know on a term contract or something with Public Works, uh, obviously you're you're used to that on a weekly basis on your agenda. Um, the other piece, uh, and then of course uh, the other significant spending for the county on the uh, personnel side, uh, the board's uh, budget process establishes uh, authorized positions and and pay rates and compensation. And obviously those are overseen between budget and human resources uh, and the policies and procedures that they oversee to make sure we're spending within our personnel budgets. So those, those several areas sort of set the financial controls uh, of being able to stay within the legal authority that's established within the budget. Um, I'll, I'll go into a little more here in a moment, but uh, you know we have some things where we look back after the fact and through our audit and through our financial reporting to assure that the management of our dollars ends up at the end of the year by coming in budget. And uh, certainly in my tenure of over 20 years, I've found that we, that our processes work to maintain the spending within, within our allocated budgets. Uh, the only other uh, piece I want to point out before we uh, turn to Ted and, and delve into the budget process a bit more, uh, the ways in which the budget translates into daily activity through a fiscal year, and then ultimately into some of the financial 
uh, reporting and, and required reporting that the county does. Uh, obviously, throughout the year, we're spending, we get to year end, June 30th. Um, some of the behind the scenes that, that the board and public don't see quite as much after the fact, you know, here we are end of August. Uh, we take the months of July and August basically to uh, close out and finalize the year end. So a lot of the invoices and bills that are still coming in from things that were uh, accomplished uh, toward the end of the fiscal year are still being uh, recorded and applied against, uh, in this case, fiscal year 21, uh, starting in about the next two weeks, over the next three months then with our external auditors, uh, Cone Resnick, the county's external auditors will begin their uh, financial audit, CPA firm audit of the county. At the same time, I like to point out, it's important that the county's what we call component units, the four uh, primary uh, entities that the county funds uh, separately, the Carroll County Board of Education, Carroll Community College, uh, the Carroll County Public Library, and the Carroll County's Industrial Development Authority are also closing their books and having their financial audits completed, and those end up uh, being incorporated into the county's uh, year-end audit when we release financial statements. Uh, there is a state reporting requirement that doesn't get a lot of uh, attention, but it it establishes uh, the method for reporting financial activity to the state. So it is uh, a very consistent document that each county and jurisdiction is required to submit. It's generally due by the end of October, but that's a difficult deadline to meet. And we historically have requested an extension to the end of December so that we complete it along with a lot of our other financial reports. That's called the Uniform Financial Report. And it's it's uh, due to the Department of Legislative Services. That is the basis by which they um, put out some of the state reports that show every county and municipality across the state, you know, the tax revenues, the spending, the debt, and some of that data. Then, of course, uh, the important uh, process we go through in the fall of uh, credit ratings and issuing the official statement and leading into our county's bond issue. So two of the two of the important documents we present, and sorry, we switched virtual here, so I don't have pictures, but you'll recognize the county's official statement and our credit rating presentation. Those are important documents as we present uh, data to the three credit rating agencies. Uh, again, this is all um, financial data we've compiled through the year. We issue generally uh, to the board and to the public our uh, audited annual financial statements, uh, generally early to mid-December is our goal. Um, of course, that ends up being uh, reported to the public and we put it on the website. It, it's our general available financial statements, but also specifically for compliance purposes, the state of Maryland, the federal government, again, the credit ratings receive that. We post it on an external site called uh, DAC, which is our uh, bond issue compliance uh, partner and um, meets our re required uh, disclosures of financial information to bondholders in the bond community. And then lastly, as you know, we participate in, a, in the government finance officers uh, award of certificate of achievement for financial reporting. And about, for about the last 35 consecutive years, we've received that award, which is a sort of a best practice, peer review, and uh, each year they're recommending ways we can improve our financial reporting. So uh, ultimately it leads to our uh, comprehensive annual financial report. This is our annual audited financial statements. It also includes um, uh, a significant amount of uh, demographic and economic information and indicators. Um, of course, you know, the primary difference between uh, my department and what you work on with Ted is most of my reporting is uh, looking back after the fact, uh, showing the actual data and the actual dollars that uh, came in and out. So an important component to that document is the, are the various schedules that uh, provide for budget to actual comparison. And again, that's, that's where we can really show legal compliance that we uh, met our spending within our legal authority within the budget that's broken out by function and further in the back by uh, each agency that receives a budget basically each uh, project line item that you're used to it shows basically what the budget uh, budget was 
and what the actual spending for the year was and how that comes out. And of course that provides a baseline of important data to Ted and his staff as they begin looking to the new year. But I recognize there's always a lag where we're uh, beginning to the audit of fiscal year 21. At the time, Ted and his staff are kicking off and beginning to look at the beginning stages of establishing fiscal year 23's budget. So, you know, there's a good year and a half to almost two year lag between the beginning of a budget process to the end of a uh, fiscal year closeout and audited financial statements being issued. That's about a two year cycle generally for, for each year. So that's one way to think of that. And then the last piece is uh, about 30 days after our issuance, our, uh, we're due uh, reporting to the federal government for the what they call the single audit, which is the federal awards uh, audit of grant dollars. And uh, typically that's a little more behind the scenes uh, this year and over the next couple of years with the um, various federal programs that have come out uh, for COVID relief uh, and the dollars being significantly more, uh, we'll see significantly more uh, invested time and dollars into that single audit. And obviously uh, those are important components. So I thought we'd just lead off with some of that uh, broad financial, the way the budget ties into the financial and the financial reporting. And then in turn, the financial reporting providing the baseline for uh, looking forward to that next year's budget. We work closely with Department of Management and Budget and Ted and, and his staff on data sharing and making sure we're not duplicating efforts in how we uh, provide financial information to you, to the public, uh, post on our website and meet all of our variance reporting requirements. So, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it's kind of the end of the process. We thought we'd kind of address that. That's that's some of the back end that's going to happen after the fact. Uh, and I guess I'll turn it to Ted to kind of show uh, budget process from from beginning how we how we kind of form and get there. So, obviously, open to any questions now or as we uh, conclude. And thank you for your time. So, Rob, um, I appreciate all the information. I'm not sure why uh, we're doing this, but that's okay. Um, everything, the key to our success is everything you do and everything we do in the decision-making process is out there and is packaged uh, appropriately um, for the community to see, correct? Certainly, uh, all the financial data that I just referenced is yeah. either formed in public session, basically uh, through the public hearing process, through the adoption of the budget, and the various documents that, that this office provides, and certainly the published uh, budget document that the right. board and department of budget uh, provides yeah, as well. So I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I guess it's okay to, to capture all this and we're, you know, you know, maybe you can make a fact sheet of what you just shared, um, but... I mean, what you did was you um, gave me confidence in, yes, this is what we do. Um, and uh, like I said, the, the key to our success is our openness um, throughout the year. And the development of everything we do, and Ted's will talk next, I guess, about the budget process, which is very deliberate and, again, uh, communicated throughout the year on how we do it and then the work you do. Um, so, yeah, without understanding the, the why we're doing this now, uh, thanks for that roll up. Uh, and if anybody in the community has any questions, I'm sure they can either reach out to us or to you and you we, or you can point them in the direction necessary uh, for those documents. Um, and uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, I guess, uh, Ted, you want to uh, talk about what you're going to talk about? <laughs> hey, uh, just, sure. just, just really, uh, really quick. Down in Mako, um, you know, uh, the work you did um, is always appreciated, and I always seem to learn just uh, that much more. Um, you know, that panel discussion on Saturday, uh, you did a great job, as always, so thank you, and to your team. Hey, just really quick to, to tag on to what you just said, Commissioner Rothstein. Uh, down at MACO, we were uh, called out uh, a couple times in several of the sessions that I was in uh, on 
uh, the procedures that we have in place, unlike anybody in the state of Maryland. I, I want to make sure that folks know that, you know, we get people that, well, we don't get too many people that complain about this. And again, I'm, 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 not, I'm unclear as to why we're doing this now. Uh, we just started a new year fiscally. Um, I've been doing this for seven years. Um, uh, not that I'm an expert, but I know what's going on, but I wanted to point out that we were, uh, we were pointed out at several of the things that I was in last week uh, for our policies, our process and procedures that we do, unlike anyone in the state. Y'all get that? Unlike anyone in the state. I'm done. Okay, um, on the why, just so you don't think we just stopped in here on a whim, uh, Commissioner Boucher asked for this presentation. So we are, we are doing this in, in response to his, his request. Uh, I want to start by trying to show you something. This pile here is the information that commissioners receive during the budget process. And that actually isn't the whole pile because in each process, we are uh, generating documents and information for you in response to things that are happening as we go. So that would, that would add to that. But that's all the iterations of the budget that we go through, the presentations we do, information that you're, you're given on the budget. Uh, Chris, can we bring up the, um, the budget calendar we sent you? Okay, um, this is set up in a circle with intent because the process just goes on and on forever. And I'm gonna start with July, the beginning of our fiscal year, but you really could jump in anywhere and it, and it doesn't matter because we're always doing something. Now, um, for your benefit, would you, would you like me to leave this calendar up or do you want to just take a look at it and then take it down? Uh, Commissioner Boucher, your it's it's your request. Oh, so. yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, leave it up. I think the visuals are really critical for people to see how the process works. Unless it interferes with something else you don't present, you can take it down. Okay, so we're going to start in July. Uh, now, as Rob was talking in July, we're still involved in closing out the previous fiscal year. And that's not just about accounting. That's also things happening in budget to, to finish things up. So even when we've left the fiscal year, uh, we still haven't fully left it. Capital budget direction goes out to the agencies in July. This is the first step in the next capital process. When we send out direction, what we are doing is reminding people of what's already in the six-year capital improvement plan that you've adopted. We give them some idea of the resources that we think are going to be available. And usually that's accompanied by some idea of there's not enough money to do everything, so think hard about what you're asking for. But we do also tell people, don't not request something because you assume it won't get funded. If you believe something is important, critical, that's gonna hurt us if it doesn't get done, we need to talk about those things. That doesn't mean that it's gonna get done, but it has to be on the table for discussion. Now, when there's not enough money, then we do discourage asking for things that would be just nice to have because we, we know the lineup of things that need to get done is al already too big. But even at that, there will be lots of things entered into the process that have very little chance of, of moving ahead just because there are too many higher priorities. Now, we send out this capital direction. There's a number of things that are happening. One is we're asking every agency Tell us what you think you're going to need, and not just for next year, for the next six years. Uh, there are other pieces of, of this. We have 
agents, other agencies who are involved in um, capital process for, for everybody. So if you are looking for IT, things are gonna be affected by IT. We have to let them know about that. If you're gonna be looking for uh, uh, a building, building construction needs to be uh, in, included in that. And there's a number of agencies like this. So we're trying to make sure that everybody who needs to be involved is getting information early so that we can be um, prepared as we move through the process. Now in August, there's no label on that. That doesn't mean there's nothing going on. Work has begun on the capital process at that point. When I say work has begun, the budget analysts are reviewing the requests. They're beginning to work with the agencies and working with the agencies and what we're doing is saying, okay, uh, how important is this? What happens if this doesn't happen? What alternatives do we have? Where did you get these price estimates? What did you base that on? Could we look at this a different way? What happens if we don't do this? And a much, much longer list. And what we're trying to do is to sort through all the requests to say, what are the things that have to happen? There's really no choice. What are the things that we think are really important to happen? And divide those from the things it'd be nice to do if we could, but don't have as compelling an argument. Okay, well, actually, I jumped ahead a little bit. I'm sorry. We get the capital request in September. So everything, I, everything I was just saying actually begins happening in September, not in August. I should point out in, in August, though, um, we received the last of our income tax distributions. Remember, income tax is our second largest revenue. And even though our year ended on June 30th, we don't know what our income tax is for the fiscal year until almost the end of August. So it always makes it challenging to be planning ahead. Now in October, operating budget direction goes out to all the agencies. Uh, a similar thing happens to what I described with the capital budget. We're trying to give people a sense of what we're dealing with. So they see the six year operating plan that you've adopted. They know what plans you have built in for each of the agencies. We share with them our assessment of what revenue is looking like. And similarly, that almost always is, there's not gonna be enough money to do everything, so choices will, will need to be made. Through the fall, a lot of the focus is on the capital budget. We're trying to get that as close to wrapped up as we can before we get heavily into the operating budget. Uh, it can't be avoided that you're doing both of them at the same time, but we, we like to split them up as, as best we can. But even when the capital budget is largely done, there are items that will continue to get work well into the budget process as we continue to evaluate you know, alternatives or look harder at numbers on certain projects. The operating budget requests come in in December and then the analysts begin working with their agencies in a similar way to what I described in the capital budget to say, how do, how do we sort through this to figure out the things that are going to happen, the things we want to happen? What are, what are the arguments for going one way or another? Now, at this point, the budget analysts are working with the agencies, questioning what's there, trying to understand agency's point of view, trying to get to a common ground so that we, 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 we know that we're both understanding things the same way. Uh, each analyst is working with their agencies to get to their individual budget analyst's recommended budget. That's what they're carrying forward into the process saying, I've done the work on this budget. Here's what I think is a, a reasonable recommendation to build into the process. And we, we don't have enough time to talk about all the things that go into it, but I just want you to understand some of how this works. Uh, budget analysts will be questioning increases in budgets. That doesn't mean that we assume that every increase is bad or, or wrong. 
increases are necessary. We just want to make sure that the ones that are in there are truly necessary, or is there discretion, and do we need to consider other priorities? But <clears throat> the process isn't just about cutting budget requests. Uh, if analysts are doing good work and the ones you have working for you do, uh, sometimes they're saying to an agency, you didn't increase this part of your budget or you decreased this part of the budget. What's your thinking there? And sometimes that leads to a budget analyst saying, no, I think, I think this really needs to be higher, not lower. We, we want to be realistic. We want to deal with what's really going to be in front of us. And we don't want to create problems for ourselves by making a budget work because we left out spending that really is going to need to be there. So when the analysts have all gotten through all their individual budgets, we bring all that together, and not literally, but we kind of dump that all on a table that we're all sitting around. Now the job is to say, how do we pull this together into a full recommendation that will be given to the commissioners for them to begin their deliberations. When we dump that all on the table, one thing we know is there's too much on the table. It's not going to all stay. We, we will never be able to fund the individual recommendations that each analyst is bringing. And the reason is, at that point, they're not coordinating with each other. We're not trying to hit a certain target. We're saying, okay, we know we need to be careful. We can't just approve everything. But what do we think ought to be carried further into the conversation? So that becomes another part of the process. How do we take all those individual recommendations and work this in to one big recommendation that does work within the revenue that we think will be available? That's an important point. That's my starting point. We determine how much revenue we think we're going to be available. And we build you a budget recommendation that is doable within the amount of money that's going to be there. That's an important point because not all jurisdictions work that way. Uh, sometimes the process is you add up all those recommendations, you say, okay, how much do we need to spend? And then the question becomes, how do we get enough revenue to fund this? So just want to be clear, that's no part of our thinking. So in this part of the process, budget analysts are acting in part as advocates for their agencies. They are saying, I've already done the work with them. I believe in what I'm bringing here. I think this needs to be part of our, our recommendation. But then we have to start working through that because, again, we know we're not going to be able to fund all those things. So that leads to conversations about relative priorities, relative levels of urgency, the relative impact of, doing, of not doing something versus not doing something else. And we know whether it's in our recommendation or in your proposed budget or the budget that you eventually adopt, every dollar that you decide to give somebody to provide a service is also a dollar that you are not giving to somebody else to provide some other service. It's, it's the, the fundamental truth of what we do. We can only spend each dollar one time. So we're trying to figure out what's the best path to, to doing that. Now as we're doing that, there's a lot of things in the mix. Uh, the existing operating plan is part of our mix. Commissioners have already made decisions about where they intend to go in the future. Now, we know that that doesn't set a path that can't be changed. In fact, we know it will be changed. But it does set a path. And we're trying to say, unless there's a reason to change, this ought to look a lot like uh, what the commissioners have already suggested to us. And we're also trying to keep in, in, in mind what direction we have from the board. And, you know, every year I'll come to you and say, uh, you know, anything you can tell us on places you know you want to go or places you know you don't want to go, we will do our best to shape this to meet that vision. That can be challenging because the board doesn't always have a nice neat package to offer us on here's where we want to go. And in fact, what we get more often is each of you talking about what things you're most interested in the process. And that's good information to have, but doesn't always help us to say, 
where does the board want to end up? And you know, on that point, where does the board want to end up? You know, I, I haven't said this yet, and it's kind of, it almost goes without saying in my mind, but it, it need, does need to be said. In the end, this is your budget. We're doing a lot of work. We're trying to bring you packages that you can work with. But in the end, you decide what the budget is. And our job at that point is to make that happen and to make the services that are implied, make all those things happen. You know, I, I have my opinions along the way. Um, in each process, there'll be times where I'll suggest you might want to consider another course. But it's your call that this is, this is the commissioner's budget. So we're working through that recommendation. You know, we're thinking about the operating plan. We're thinking about what direction we have. We're thinking about all the work the analysts and the agencies have, have done. And trying to weigh all the various trade-offs. And it's always difficult because there will be things that won't get included in the recommendation, not because we don't think they're good ideas, but because there's not enough money to fund all the good ideas. Some things just can't make it in because there's not enough money to do it. And at least interesting situations sometimes. You know, we can find ourselves debating with the agencies about something that's not in. And they'll be telling me all the good reasons why it should happen. At some point, I say, I understand. I'm with you. I agree. It should happen. Problem is, we don't have enough money to fund everything that we need to. Now, when things are left out of the budget recommendation, later in the process, there is an opportunity for the agencies to come to the commissioners to say, management and budget did not include this in the recommendation. Maybe they say, I understand their thinking. Maybe they say, I don't understand what they were thinking about. But either way, they can come to you and say, I would like you to consider this thing that didn't make it into the budget. Now, no agency is going to come to you to talk about everything that didn't make it into the budget. There's just there's too much. But they will focus on the things that they're saying, this, this really matters to me. I think that this is a problem if it doesn't happen, or I really need to see this happen. And they will come to you to try and share their thinking on that so that as you're working through your proposed budget, you, you understand both what I brought to you and there are pl the places where they might disagree with what I brought to you. So that's all working toward a recommended budget. That's still a little ways down the road. In January, we come to you with what we call the preliminary recommended CIP. And this developed for two reasons. One, the Planning Commission has a role in the CIP. They have to approve it for consistency with the master plan. So for many years, we have developed this preliminary CIP so that they have something to react to. And then the other thing that's happening at this point is we are making a request to the General Assembly for bond authorization authority. And to do that, we have to have some sense of how much authority we want to ask for. And you might remember, you know, every year you meet with the delegation and they ask, when are you going to get us the number? And we tell them, this meeting is coming up. As soon as we do this, we'll get the number down, down to you. And again, part of it is, you know, if you're going to determine how much bonding we need, you have to have some idea of what you think the projects are going to be. So we do this. And it's a little bit awkward because it's early in the process. In fact, before we talk to you about what you might want to do in this process. So this is largely driven by the CIP that you adopted in the prior year. Uh, in theory, this could be a problem if there are big changes in, in the CIP. That's not what typically happens. And we're not entirely reliant on what you ask for in this authorization. We do have some cushion and authorization that's been built up over years so that if things change, we know we do have the room to react. 
February, we're mostly focusing on the operating budget now and pushing toward that recommendation. Oh yeah, and I should also say December, January, February, we're also hard at work on the revenue projections. Uh, in beginning of January, uh, the new assessment information comes out. Uh, that sets our path for projecting property tax, our biggest revenue. Now, the biggest part of property tax is real property, which is very tied to the assessments. There are some other pieces, though, public uh, uh, utilities and, and business property. We have much less information available for those, and they're big enough to be important to us. So we're trying to struggle with the information we have to say, what do we think we can reasonably build into this production? Income tax, we don't get our first big look at income tax until the end of November. So that kicks off a lot of the serious discussion on, on in, income tax. And between property tax and income tax, you're talking about something approaching 90% of your operating budget revenue. So there's other stuff we need to do, and it's there's still other revenues that are important enough that they take work. But these are the two places that are the bulk of the revenue. Now, when we're trying to come to this revenue projection, there's a couple of big ideas that drive how we approach this. One is we don't want to tell you that you're going to have more revenue that we feel confident that you're going to actually get. And the reason for that is if we tell you you're going to have $100 million and partway through the year we see, oh, this isn't going to work out, we're probably only going to have $95 million. You've already adopted a budget. As, as Rob pointed out, you've created a, a law saying what spending can happen, how much resources people are going to have. You've already told people all that. So if we're suddenly going to be $5 million short or 5% short of our budget, we have to start reacting. And that means telling people, you thought you were going to spend money that you're not going to be able to spend. And you can't do that equally. If we have to pull back, you can't go to everything you fund and just say, give us money back. You can't go to the school system. You can't go to the college. Maybe you can go to the state's attorney and circuit court. Probably difficult. You can't go to the board of elections. And there's some more like that. So that means if we have to pull back toward the end of the year, you have to look at 5% of your entire budget and get that out of the agencies to actually report to you which means significantly larger cuts to them. So we don't want that to happen. That's a problem. And we have lived this, not because of our own mistake, but in fiscal year 10, the state during the year made major funding cutbacks to the counties that forced us to react in the middle of the year. They, they, they put us into that situation, and it was not a good place to be. So now we're working toward March when we're going to actually there's a step on here that there's a step that's not on this calendar. We come to you, um, I believe in March with what we call the overview. And we're doing two things in the overview. One, we're sharing with you what we think we're seeing in revenue projections although we will continue to work on them at that, at, at that point. But we're also giving you kind of a look at what's coming. You know, uh, what do we see happening in the economy? What do we see happening with prices? What do we see happening in the General Assembly? Have there been any changes in mandates? Do we have new information now that we didn't have when we adopted the budget? We're trying to give you a sense of what you're going to be working with. And often that's, you know, I'll give you a, a, a list of the things that I'm worried about. I'm saying, here's things we need to be thinking about. We're going to have to deal with in the, in the budget process. This is all just to get you thinking about what's going to be coming, how we're going to go about working our way through this process. Then we come to you with our recommendation. That's the recommendation on everything, your operating budget, the capital budget, enterprise funds, what the grant fund is going to look like, the entire package. And again, I said this a little bit earlier, what this is, is that at this point is working in within the resources that we think we have available, the direction we think we have, the plans that are already in place, what 
do we think is a starting point for your deliberations? Then you have your agency hearings. This is your opportunity to hear from the agencies. And I mentioned earlier, I didn't say this word, we call it issues. But this is where the agencies can bring up their issues, things that did not make it into the recommendation that they would like you to consider as you move forward. Then the budget office and you spend a lot of time together. This is your proposed budget sessions, your deliberations. Uh, this is partially you reacting to the recommendation we've made to you, partially considering the things that you want to get into the mix that aren't in there now, considering priorities, considering the trade-offs between maybe adding something that's not in and what would have to come out to make that happen. Uh, this is always a, a difficult thing to do. You're faced with the same things that we're faced with. You'll be looking at too many things that you're saying, this is a good idea, we ought to do this, but you don't have enough money to just do all those things. So you also are faced with that choice. What are the things that would be good to do that just aren't going to make it because we can't afford it? That part of the process is all driving toward your proposed budget, the, the budget you release to the public. This is the point in the process where this officially becomes the commissioner's budget. This is the thing that you're saying to the public, here's where we think we're going, tell us what you think. Now you'll get reactions in different ways, you know, emails, phone calls, people stopping you in the grocery store. We do hold a formal public hearing on the budget. Uh, in most years, non-COVID years, you know, we meet for a long time in meeting at the Scott Auditorium at the community college. People can come in to share with you their thoughts. We give people three minutes to, to talk. It's not an interactive session. You're there to listen, but uh, it, it's not an opportunity for debate. And I should back up a step. After you release your proposed budget, again, in most years, I go around the county. I visit five libraries to share your proposed budget and to listen to what people have to say or answer any questions that, uh, that they have. And on questions, you know, something I tell them is, you know, if you want to know where that number come from, where do I find this information, how did this happen, those are all questions I can try and answer for them. But if they have questions of policy, if they're saying, we don't agree you should be doing this, or we think you should do something you're not doing, those things I suggest you need to share that with the commissioners. Those are the things that they need to decide. So then you have the public hearing. We put together the information that comes out of that. We share that with you. You have a little time to think through things and then we schedule a session for you to consider any changes you wanna make before you adopt the budget. Now, at this point, we're well into the process. Uh, making sweeping changes would be very difficult to do now, and it typically is not part of the conversation. But there is still opportunity to say, do we want to do something differently than what we put into the proposed budget? That could be adding something that's not in, could be swapping out one thing for, for another. Uh, but you'll make some final decisions there. Uh, we capture that in the, the law that will become the budget that you adopt. And then before the end of May, you actually have to take action on that to pass that law, which will set up the spending authority for the next fiscal year. And we spend the rest of the year trying to get that all into place uh, to get the budget document out to the public to begin preparing for the spending that will now happen in July, and we're back into that part of the circle again. But throughout this whole process, the budget analysts are doing a lot of things. You know, they're working with their agencies, working on the revenue projections, you know, working through all the information we have, trying to figure out what, what to do creating these documents that we're talking about, all these presentations and the iterations of the budget books, all the information that we're providing you as we go through the, the process. 
and also reacting to your requests through the process. As you ask for things individually, it probably doesn't hit you. But when you look at everything that you ask for as you go through the process, you know, can I get some more information on this? Can I get some history on this? What would it mean if we do this? Uh, they're often scrambling to try and pull those things together for you. Yeah, think about that. I left out a part of the, the proposed process. Uh, a big part of how that works is we um, can't think of a word. You know, we 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 can show you your options on budget changes on the fly. We have we have it up on the screen, spreadsheet up on the screen for you, and we are as you are saying. Well, what if we added this? How does that affect the operating plan? What if we took this out? What if we made this change? So we're able to give you, most of the time, almost immediate picture of what is the impact of various changes. And then you can use that as you all are discussing with each other, what are, what are the things you want to do? And debating your priorities among each other and debating the, these trade-offs, all leading to an eventual set of decisions that becomes that proposed budget that we, we talked about. So there's lots more I could say. I, I, I think that gives you, I hope that gives you a pretty good idea of how the process works and what's happening at various spots. But now I can talk about anything more that you would want or answer any questions that you have. Okay, thanks, Ted. Um, any questions or comments at this point? I, I just want to comment. I want to give my sincere appreciation to both Controller Burke and Director Zaleski to bring this information forward for public awareness. And I appreciate the indulgence of my colleagues. This can be a little bit boring. We've been through it. But there's a public out there that needs to understand everything we're faced with and the process we go through. I think this helps set up for the next item on the agenda. And I especially want to thank Director Zaleski for mentioning his analysts the analysts in our budget department are so critical on how we put together and perform our budget process and are behind the scenes and not a lot of people know about them but mr zaleski has a fine top-notch team behind the scenes working with all our agencies and departments and i want to give a special thanks to him so thanks for this presentation so to, to me nothing about this is boring uh it is a year-round process that's transparent to the community uh and I really always appreciate that. Like uh, Commissioner Wynn said, it seems like others should be looking at the way we have our processes in place. And I think their jurisdictions would run a, a heck of a lot smoother because it comes down to all those books, to these two books that we adopt. This is the law. And this is not delegated to anybody but the five of us to adopt. And any thoughts differently are 100% wrong, full stop. Uh, we do not delegate our authorities when it comes to our budget and the opportunity to execute the budget throughout the year, like we did today with uh, purchases, that comes from that budget. And it's not new news. It is uh, established from the budget that we established, uh, you know, this past year. Um, so this allows, again, more confidence for us and the community to know that we have a process in place. Um, the budget's the law uh, that we establish, and nothing at all is delegated to you, to the comptroller, to the CAO, to the staff. It is ours, and we own it. So uh, I, I think that's the, the big takeaway for me um, from this. Is there any other comments on this okay let's uh move on to the next agenda oh go ahead commissioner Frazier. uh no it's it's fine we can move on it, it's all good it's sure? <laughs> okay so commissioner boucher you want to uh take the lead on what are we calling this uh apologize proposed amendments to the budget preparation process, commissioner agenda setting process and organizational structure. 
Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, I'm very grateful for everyone indulging me in this budget process. And this is a culmination and a perfect timing, I think, because this will be our last budget session to go through together. And I want to take the opportunity, you know, the first year I hit the ground running, I'm green, I'm, I'm shocked. Like Commissioner Wayne said, you get that big pack of your first year. Sometimes you're just looking at the numbers and your mind goes blank. So I'm very much concerned about that for the next board coming on, because the reality is there's definitely don't be four new commissioners. There's no guarantee Commissioner Rothstein can get reelected. I support that reelection, but you never know in politics that there's definitely going to be four new commissioners, could be five. That'll be a whole new set of green commissioners coming on board. And this public awareness will help people out there looking at the process, get a concept to understand what they're doing. And I also want to make some revisions in how we conduct this process. <clears throat> Not that what's going on is bad, but to try to help, so to speak, put training wheels on these new commissioners so they don't have to face some of the hurdles I seen when I came on board. So I have some potential revisions and, and reforms I want to propose. Also, I have concerns over the inflation. We're already seeing within two weeks, we've seen some large multi-million dollar projects going over budget. That's all unfold throughout the year. We don't, it's like shifting tides or shifting sands, trying to build a foundation on. So I think it'd be good to get more on the front end of it this year than later on as a potential. Also, we're not, we have more federal dollars coming in. So the public is watching us as a commissioner board take on millions and millions of more dollars. Well, they're very much aware of it. And I'm going to eat crow feathers and all and recognize that Commissioner Wance last year was 100% correct and I was 100% wrong when I advocate and fought against him to give the federal emergency funding signature authority, so to speak, over to our county administrator. Commissioner Wance was in tune with his constituents and he reacted to it and supported it. And I was absolutely wrong and not recognizing that that was her constituents concerns. And what I think Commissioner Wance recognized in that is that we as county commissioners are both legislative, such as we're doing now, we need as a, a collective buying debate, we're legislative. But what's unique about county commissioners is we're also executive. And part of that signature authority and send that money over, Commissioner Wance was absolutely right. That is part of our executive process. And I think so often in this position, we can get kind of cushiony with their administrators doing so much for us, that makes their job easier. But I don't think the citizens out there are comfortable with the amount of authority we relinquish over to our administrators. And that signature writing authority is a prime example of it. I've heard from my constituents, Commissioner Wance heard from his constituents and he was absolutely right. So it made me re-examine how we we're conducting business. Granted, we have absolutely fantastic administrators. They do good jobs. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we have constitutional authority that our constituents want us to fulfill. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, can I have brought up the existing organizational, organizational chart of the county, if Mr. Swan can present that? And it shows the structure of our existing government. Here we have the county commissioners who are the elected representatives of people who actually hold sole authority over this county government. And then we have below us the county administrator. All the departments, 12 in total, I believe it comes out to, are coming through our county administrator. I don't think our constituents voted for this. I think what our constituents voted for was for us to be both executive and legislative. That's why they're so passionate about maintaining commissioner government. They view the county administrator as an unelected county executive. And if you look at the chart, you see how much power and control that position has with all the directors going through that position before it comes to us. I do not believe that is what our constituents want. What our constituents want is for us to have more direct contract, contact in the chain of command with all those departments. What inevitably happens is our county administrator being the unelected executive takes and ensures that there's execution and implementation of the things we pass as a legislative body. I don't think that's proper. What I think should happen is that 
we as commissioners directly interact with those departments and have a chief of staff. Can I have the sample of the proposed organizational chart I'm proposing brought up? With this proposal, the publicly elected officials, us, the county commissioners, will have direct contact with all the department heads, eliminate the county administrator, create a chief of staff of operations, which handles all the internal affairs and a deputy chief of staff of services. And this is in compliance with numerous things would bring us in compliance with both political science and administrative science and their execution of government. One, on a previous uh, chart, it showed that all those departments coming directly through an unelected official, it's a total of 12. Anyone out there that understands administrative science knows that no more than seven department heads should be answering anyone or you lose your influence and control. So this chart would allow that to be addressed. It also addresses the political science of not going through an unelected representative. So we'd have a chief of staff who would oversee the operations, just like a private sector corporation, controller, human resources, IP, all those necessary things to maintain the health and well-being of the organization, like the engine. The other side of our organization would have all the services. All the departments are directly interacting and providing the things we as a uh, commissioner board need to give to the people, the planning, the rec and parks, the department of public works. This would make the job of the chief of staff and the deputy chief of staff easier because it's unfair to be running so much information through one person in a system that violates our political science principle as both the executive and legislative authorities. Also, I believe it'd be best in that format I've proposed to divide up all the departments and agencies that we as county commissioners are responsible for in our budget and work with them. I get a feeling from most employees I've talked to and the citizens out there that they favor this concept. They don't like the fact that we have an unelected county administrator in that position. And with that said, I want to read off some laws to back up what I'm getting at. Thanks to the county attorney. Under Chapter 747, House Bill 1228, Section 1, be it enacted by the General Assembly of Maryland that the new Section 34MM, 34NN, and 3400, be they are hereby added to the Code of Public Law of Carroll County, 34MM. Carroll County, com the county commissioners of Carroll County shall establish orderly procedures for budgeting and finance which shall designate a county employee or officer as budget director, budget officer, responsible for assigning the county commissioners or assisting the county commissioners in the preparation and administration of budgets. So it's purely within their discretion how we structure this organization. I seem like we've inherited this organization and prior to seven years ago, the county government had a chief of staff and then it changed over. So it's important, I think, to go back to that chief of staff position because that existed so long and there was a reason for it. If we look at the other code, Resolution 332-75, Amendment to the Resolution 11-71, Budget Financial Facilities. Orderly Procedures for Budgeting and Finance. 2-01, Office of County Budget Officers hereby created. He shall have the following duties. The budget officer shall be responsible for formulation of the budget under the supervision of the county commissioners, including the review of allotments, the control of positions, and the development of an annual work project progress programs, research on economic trends, and long-term fiscal plans. The study of the organization, methods and procedures of each office, department, board, commission, institution, and agencies of the government. That includes those departments like the Sheriff's Department, the library that we all finance. The submission of the county commissioners of periodic reports on their efficiency and economy and such other duties and functions as may be assigned to him as director of administration. It goes, I want to state this because it goes back to the county administrator position. That nowhere in this law does it state, well, what it states in qualifications for director of administration. The director of administration shall be a certified public accountant listed, licensed in the practice in the state of Maryland. I don't think it's legitimate for us to have a county administrator 
whether you call it a county administrator or a director of administration, it's just a word play. If that is the case, then the present position filled as county administrator does not meet the CPA requirement to hold that position. Therefore, that position should be dissolved and we should restructure this. Our existing county administrator has a JD and is phenomenal organization. I'll say very good things about her ability and co uh, competence, but it does not fit properly with the law and it does not fit properly with the political science of commissioner of government. So I'd like to see that position eliminated and move to chief of staff. And I'd like to see us divide up all the departments and agencies so that we have better involvement from the front end. It has been my understanding interviewing our controller, Mr. Burke, that approximately 60% of our budget process unfolds outside of us. I find it unacceptable that we should be more involved in the front end. And we need to set up these processes and, and procedures here that I'm recommending so that when that new board comes in, they're not gonna be sent out wasting their time visiting nonprofits. Granted, nonprofits are absolutely wonderful and we support them. But when you look at their county budget, they are a very small fraction and they are not the county government. Immediately, we should have procedures in place where those new commissioners are meeting with the managerial departments of everything when they, they finance, even the agencies, and start getting an understanding of the budget process. I felt like a deer in headlights, and I'm sure every single one of my colleagues felt like it their first term in spring when they had a recommended budget drop for them. They had no depth in understanding what was going on. So with potentially four or five new commissioners coming on board, immediately when they're coming on board as officers of the public officers of this county, they should be immersed in understanding the budget and imaginal teams. With that, I'd like to leave it up for discussion before I try to make some motions for you. Is there any opinion or, or discussion on what I've discussed? Okay, open for discussion. Does anybody have discussion at this time? Nope. All right. Well, with that, I'd like to motion, make the motion that all items on the agenda must have a commissioner sponsorship footnoted on the agenda so that they are brief prior to session. I apologize. So I have one through five here. Uh, Eric, are you talking about number two? Yeah, I'd like to see us take a more active role in the agenda. And I'll preface this motion with this, that on a political science term, that in every single public elected institution, you have to have the sponsorship of a publicly elected official to be on the agenda. Nothing, absolutely nothing goes on the congressional agenda unless it's sponsored by a congressman. Absolutely nothing goes on the General Assembly agenda unless it's sponsored by a delegate or senator, and Commissioner Wayne is very much familiar with this process. If you move into our neighboring counties that have county councils, nothing goes on a council's agenda unless it's sponsored by a councilman. I find it repugnant that here in Carroll County, we are blatantly in violation of that most basic political science premise, which means the public is watching us surrender their authority on the agenda to our administration. And they do not know who is behind line items coming up on the agenda. Case in point, back in January, and it upset a lot of constituents, and that's part of what's motivating me on this, is there was this system benefit tax on our agenda. None of us sponsored it. Where did it come from? Did that mean it came from our administrators? Why are administrators putting things on our agenda if we don't know about it? That is completely unacceptable. Everything that goes on our agenda should be briefed upon at least one of us so we know ahead of time or prove it to be put on there. So it's insane that we do not follow the most basic political science premise by every other jurisdiction level in our federal system. So in order to maintain consistency, I'm wholeheartedly for this proposal that everything must be briefed and sponsored by at least one commissioner to be on the agenda. Okay, so with that said, 
and you gotta correct me if I'm wrong, the motion that you're presenting is that all items on the agenda must have a commissioner sponsor and footnote on the agenda so they are briefed prior to the to the session. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Do I have a second on that? Seeing none, motion uh, fails. I'll go with the first one right now. I move that all departments and agencies financed in the county budget shall be evenly divided amongst commissioners so that they participate in their budget process from beginning to end. Okay, I have a motion and we all have these uh, in our briefing books. Um, so I'm not going to reread. Do I have a second on the motion? No second, motion fails. Thank you. I move that the commissioners are to appear before advisory boards and commissions for briefings and guidance only, but not sit on any as a member thereof. Okay. I got a motion. Any second? No second. Motion right. fails. Thank you. I move that the newly elected commissioners forthcoming are to meet with managerial staff of all departments and immediately begin working on the budgets of departments evenly divided amongst them. Okay. Is that a motion? Do I have a second? No second. Okay. Motion fails. All right. And I put up the organizational chart which would restructure our system, divide in external and internal and eliminate the county administrator position and create a chief of staff position. I move that the new organizational chart that was attached and mentioned be adopted and implemented immediately. Okay, got a motion on table regarding the organization chart. Do I have a second? Seeing no second, motion fails. Okay. Thank you very much. Any further discussion regarding this from the board? Seeing here none, let's move on to the next agenda item, which goes back to the organization design and compensation study. Ms. Wyndham. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, and good morning. Um, one second. Um, um, Okay, so I'm joined today by um, Ted Zaleski and Robin Hooper uh, from Management and Budget and the um, um, Human Resources. And um, I'm going to try to share my screen. If you believe it, in all this time, I have not shared my screen before. So, <laughs> is, is everyone seeing it? We're good. Okay, great. So. Um, as I said, uh, this is uh, in response to the board's recent request in pursuing this issue of creating a, a, a compensation benefits and organizational design study. <clears throat> and so we're here today to get your approval to move forward with the study. Yep. So why are we doing this? Uh, most of this won't be new to you as we've been talking about it for some time sort of the convergence of two big ideas. First, the growing concern about our ability to successfully recruit, engage, and retain qualified employees. And I'll be back to this in a minute. Second, to identif the identification of opportunities to improve our organization. And also I'll elaborate on that more in a minute. Uh, I wanna emphasize here, although most people would lo love to have more money and make more money, um, this isn't the, sole driving force for this effort. This is being driven by a concern for the organization's ability to get and keep people we need to provide the quality services that we provide today. Basically, how are we gonna keep doing what the residents need us to do? So with regard to recruiting, engaging, and retaining, you might remember that last spring during the budget process, the Human Resources Department, in fact, Robin Hooper, came to you with a compelling presentation on our growing concerns. These concerns came up in a, num a number of times during your budget deliberations. And you have regularly mentioned these same concerns as you've dealt with regular ongoing business of the county since adopting the budget. 
some of these concerns, and of course, this is not a comprehensive list, but it captures some of the higher profile items. For, um, for example, lack of applications. It is very difficult. Um, there are many positions posted that we don't even receive applications for. When we do receive applications, frequently they're um, not qualified applications or applicants. We go, when we do get good, when we do get applications, uh, we go through the hiring process and um, we also find that they're frequently rejected at the very end. We make an offer and then the offer is rejected, unfortunately. So waste time, both with the people applying as well as our staffs. We've also found over the last few years that we need to post and repost and re-repost um, many of the positions. Um, and that sort of leads to the next bullet item. In fact, this happens so often that we've started to just leave more and more positions open until filled. We have a problem, as was mentioned um, by Human Resources during their budget presentation, of compression uh, in our scales caused by minimum wage. With an increasing minimum wage over the next several years, this will only become exacerbated. Compressions also caused um, by no increases for several years or only increases that uh, dealt with the COLA cost of living and didn't deal with the um, increment. So the scales moved, but the people didn't move within the scales. And then we all know the baby boomer problem. Uh, we have um, lots of employees, uh, a large percentage of our workforce who are eligible for retirement at any time. And we need to be able to backfill those with um, qualified and quality applicants. So we talked about this during the budget process, um, the problem we were having with filling positions. And unfortunately, I did a report that in the few months since then, the problems have gotten even worse. Approximately 10% of our positions are unfilled at the moment. And that's on top of our already concerns, our existing concerns, um, that we are understaffed in some places in the organization. But I like to say with problems, there are always opportunities. So um, last year, uh, when we were um, all experiencing COVID, um, we became very concerned, and um, the board's aware of this, of the, I, of the possibility of lost revenue to the county. And as Ted mentioned a little earlier ago, back in um, 2010, the county lost significant revenue uh, with the, with the um, recession because the state pulled back uh, some of the things that they had funded traditionally. And so we had to make up that shortfall then. So we were trying to prepare for that possibility with the, uh, last year this time. So that led us to assess the organization and potential and try to identify potential opportunities for improving the organization. And those were identified. So this is not a new problem. Uh, the budget and our ability to provide uh, the services has been squeezed for decades. So this isn't COVID related, but um, we can't simply continue to do what we've been doing. We have an opportunity here uh, I think to identify new and better ways of providing services. So I think if we can, we should. So Matt, we're asking to go to an outside, you know, to hire a firm to do an outside study. So why are we doing that? So as I mentioned at the outset, um, the board recently indicated your interest in um, studying this topic. Um, we have a very small window of time if we want to get this done by the 23 budget deliberations, which will start in March, April of uh, 22. So as a result of the time frame, um, we really don't have the resources to accomplish this in, internally with the available time. Even without the need to do this quickly, we don't have the resources as we'd have to pull people off of existing and necessary work in order to focus on this. Uh, expertise, internal expertise exists but the opportunity to take advantage of the company's um, deep experience and expertise would be uh, very nice. And I think this is really important, especially on the organizational design um, part, um, getting the opportunity to have an outside perspective unencumbered by organizational history and culture is I think um, going to serve us very well. 
So um, I'd like to say something about internal expertise. Um, I think the board is all very supportive of our staff. Um, and um, I want you to know that we do believe we have the internal expertise. Um, most of this, we, we, we know the problems, but what um, we have done, um, but we, we just don't have the, the um, time to address it internally. Uh, we have done what we could over the years with the, to address these problems within the available resources to um, staff and to the board and working also within the compensation philosophy that's been in place. Um, you've indicated um, that you're open to rethinking that philosophy and considering solutions that weren't available to the county in the past. And I think that's, um, that's, that's great. So believe this is the time to act. This is our chance to consider how to improve our compensation competitiveness at the same time as we consider how we provide those services. We need people to provide the services and we uh, need, uh, and how we provide the services impacts the people we need. In short, we need to act to protect our ability to continue to provide quality services. If we want the information um, we can use in the next budget process, the time is short, as I've alluded to. So we need to start now. We have the problem and it continues to get worse. We're facing increasing impact on services, service providers, and our employees. We can't wait another fiscal year to do something about this. So the next steps. As I said, staff have been working on this. And in fact, um, this is, there's literally late breaking news as of this morning. So we, we um, have drafted a, a request for proposal, but the time frame to get out a request for proposal, wait for the bidders to uh, submit their proposals, review them, et cetera, takes probably the better part of about six weeks. And that eats up and eats into that um, short time frame that we're trying to aim for in um, March and April. So we've also been looking um, for uh, other competitively bid contracts that we could use that um, would meet our um, you know, needs, that would align with our needs, because they have to meet our needs, otherwise it wouldn't be worth it. Um, and yet by doing that, by uh, using an existing competitively bid contract, it would shorten up that six or, or so week um, timeframe that the RFP would require. One way or another, um, of course, once, um, if we go down the RFP path or if we're able to find an existing contract, we will come back to the board for your approval um, to uh, accept the contract and, and move forward with the study. So for now, we, uh, we'd like to issue the RFP to get that process started. Um, and uh, since it takes the most time, meanwhile, we'll continue to look for opportunities to um, use an existing contract that would meet our needs. So um, with that, I'm open to questions. And I will drop this if I can figure out how. Okay, Roberta, thank you. Um, no? uh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, I did. <laughs> no. Any, uh, any comments or questions? No. Uh, I, think, sure. I think this is a perfect time to really look at our organization and how we're structured, uh, as well as compensation. So we're seeing you know way too many areas being outsourced and slowing down everything. I think we're all getting calls from people that you know what what's the hold up? Why is the county so slow in this or that area? Well, we just don't have the people to do some of these things. I, I, but if this has to be done by a total outsize out side the uh, area person uh, or a group uh, to come in and analyze the whole structure and put it together. Uh, I don't like using ones that we already know. I'd love to see one from, you know, outside come in that has no ties whatsoever to Carroll County uh, to look at it, but the time frame's tough on this one. Um, so I'm gonna leave that up to my colleagues to make uh, that decision, but, um, was a new light on here? Or, uh, no, no, I just saw the laser turn light on. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of scary. Uh, anyway, uh, the way this so, is. <laughs> so, okay, uh, Commissioner Boucher. 
your light was on. Thank you. I think this addresses a frustration I've shared with Commissioner Williams when we see these contractors come in getting, you know, a quarter million dollars to do a job and, and he's frustrated and I am along with the rest of us that why don't we have the money to hire someone internally when we, we outsource all these contracts? So this is long overdue. You know, I've, I've gone out and talked to a lot of employees who are frustrated over the fact they could get a job in the private sector. And as like the sheriff's department said in, in their field, they train people and then we lose them in other jurisdictions. In the Department of Public Works, we train people. We bring them out of vocational center, they get a little bit of experience and they go. And, and we keep losing that, that institutional knowledge. So this is long overdue and plays into what I was trying to go through earlier that we really need to examine this critically and in depth to fix this problem before it becomes worse for us. We're, we're holding the ship together, but at the end of the day, your employees have mortgages to make, children to feed, prepare for the retirement, and the less competitive we are with the private sector, the greater negative impact it has upon our organization institution. So with that, I move the Board of Commissioners ask staff to move forward with their investigation and return to the Board of Pricing when available. So as I said, um, things were, you know, are changing minutely, <laughs> literally. Right. Um, so um, if that's a, that's a fine motion, but really um, just to be clear, we're gonna go, and I'm sorry, I wrote it at the very last minute yesterday, thinking we had all the information, but. As I say, this is this is really a moving target. Um, so we want to, to um, permission really to go to RFP if that's okay, and we can pull that back if um, if we need to, if we find something we can um, we can use that would be a shorter time frame. Well, thanks for the clarification. I also want to emphasize that whoever we contract to, that they not only have the administrative science expertise, but have some political science expertise in this too, because. I'm worried that if we get a consulting firm that deals strictly with private institutions, they'll have a different view as compared to dealing with government institutions because it can be a bit tricky as the, the Juris Doctorates out there listening know that we are a public institution and as laws I read off earlier affects and impact as how we can structure things. So hopefully whoever we do get, they have some sense of political science knowledge and how they prepare their recommendations to us. Okay, so uh, the motion was modified, I believe, to also include uh, an RFP. Is that true? Okay. Do I have a second? Don't uh, just don't we need a motion to go just to go out to RFP? We don't need the motion that's written here. I, I, am I right? So we need a motion to go out to RFP to investigate um, the compensation study. And is that what? Yeah, I thought we just modified yeah, that. The motion for the RFP modified for uh, the administrator's recommendation. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, I got a motion. I got a second. Clear as mud. Any further discussion on this? I do. I do. Oh, go I, ahead, please. Geez, that guy keeps cutting me off. I turned my light on. I thought you could see me better. <laughs> I do. I do want to say, well, we're down about ten percent. There's a report, I think it was yesterday, I saw it in the news. I'll show you later, Ed, don't worry about it. I reported <laughs> in the news that Baltimore City is about 33% down on employees, 33%, almost wow. a third of the workforce, they're out because for whatever reasons, they might be different reasons than ours. But let's face it, we're all going after basically the same type of people to try to help us out. So you just got to keep that in mind. Okay. Appreciate that. Any further discussion on this? All in favor of moving forward with the RFP? Commissioner Wentz? Okay, we got 5 0. Okay, now Thank you. let's uh, move on. Uh, Mr. Swam, do we have anybody that wants to join us for public comment this morning? Yes, sir. We have one caller who I'm going to unmute right now. Caller, you're unmuted. You'll have three minutes for your public comment. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, uh, my name is Catherine Adelaide on the Carroll County Republican Central Committee. I think you all know me. Um, it's 
uh, sorry I can't see you in person. Um, thank you all for your work during the pandemic. Uh, it's been a, a tough year and a half, and I do appreciate you all. Um, just uh, procedurally, um, if someone could just take a note, for those on the phone, if they would state the item number. Um, I wasn't able to get an agenda in, from, in front of myself because I'm on vacation, actually pulled off to the side of the road, been sitting here on hold here for since 10 o'clock. Um, secondly, I either forgot or <laughs> maybe it's not new, but not letting citizens testify until after the commissioners have voted is really bad PR. It's, this is not a good way to, and these things are virtual. I got a citizen complaint trying to drum up support for my comment and right away she was like, well, they shouldn't be virtual, but if they're gonna be virtual, um, please, please, I'm begging you, if citizens are willing to get on here and wait, let them testify after each item number so that you have the citizen feedback before you vote. <laughs> okay, so um, now to the substance of it, um, Thank you for the nod to the Open Meetings Act, uh, Mr. Wance, Commissioner Wance, and uh, Mr. Commissioner Boucher, uh, your admission of uh, on the learning curve about the importance of representative government. Um, I, as a central committee, elected central committee member, fully support uh, Mr. Boucher's proposal. And I am absolutely shocked beyond any words that he did not get a second from near a one of you so it sounds like something political is going on. I'm sad about that. But this is what that huge group of citizens, of which I was just a part, uh, was coming at the commissioners about charter government. This is the answer to that. Mr. Boucher is 100% correct on everything he said. A picture is worth a thousand words. You can see from the organizational chart that clearly the commissioners will have the authority that they once gave away. So he only needs three votes. So I'm not sure what else is going on with this, but I hope there will, it can be brought back up. Um, I hate to have to call out the entire cavalry on this. The only reason there aren't more people on the line today was I didn't get it till this morning. I was on vacation. Everybody stretched in a million directions, but um, the um, you know, central committee's meeting tonight, I'm encouraging them to adopt a resolution. We, this is what we've been fighting for since we came into office, is to correct that problem. And it's a great way to correct it. So um, I thank you for your time. Again, I thank you all for your work. And I uh, hope somebody would make a motion even today to reconsider all of, his, all of it was great, but especially the organizational chart. That position needs to be eliminated. It is a de facto county executive position. The citizens don't like it. And um, once we get going here again, you'll be hearing from a lot of other people. All right, thank you all, praying for you all. Pray for my work in Annapolis. I'm here to end abortion in Maryland. Thank you for being Republicans. God bless. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, do we have anybody else? That's all we have on the line, sir. Okay. Um, open admin. Uh, anything for open admin? Yes, I have a couple of clarifications. Uh, one I'd like to deal with, you know, our senior centers, uh, we have uh, inside, uh, I guess everybody's vaccinated and have to wear masks. Are we gonna, what is our policy on this? What do we need to, where, where are we in this presently? So I believe, okay. uh, oh, go ahead, Roberta. So no, uh, people don't have to wear masks inside the senior centers. They certainly may. Um, the, so when when the board chose uh, a couple weeks ago to um, start limiting, you know, inside um, gatherings so that um, it would allow for the six foot distancing um, for folks as the Delta variant ramped up, um, the board felt that that was a, a prudent decision. Some, some adjustments had to be made in the senior centers as well. Um, and so um, initially uh, the thought was that we should limit um, or maybe even eliminate um, things like card um, playing and things because people were couldn't distance and still play cards. So that has been modified. Um, people are um, allowed to play cards just be, um, and do pretty much everything that they had done previously. Uh, just if they're going to be within six feet of each other, they're asked to wear a mask. So that's the only difference. And then um, the only other piece of this is um, 
when eating at the dining facilities or I believe playing bingo that they are to maintain six feet distance unless they are from the same household um, and they can be next to each other. I think what happened honestly is a bit of, uh, we, we took action and it got defined a little bit more guarded uh, action. And now we reeled it back. Um, what was in the paper, unfortunately, was about 48, 72 hours old as far as information. And the gray hair network jumps on things very quickly. So we were able to try to stifle it and get it back to where it needs to be. But right now, my understanding is th things are open. The hours are the way they've been. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's at least what I'm being told. Actually, a newspaper article is about a week late, by the way. No, just yeah. Uh, the hours will change back after Labor Day, I guess, to uh, 5 o'clock instead of 3 o'clock on Fridays. Is that right? Um, so the, right. So the week out, so the week of the Friday the 3rd is the last day of the summer Friday hours. Um, and, um, and then the senior centers um, and the rest of county government will go back to normal hours. For the senior centers, um, I, I believe it's 4 p.m. It may be 4.30, I can't remember exactly, but it's, it's 4, not 4.30, 4 I think, something like that, but it was yeah. 3 o'clock on Fridays now. But, okay, so if they want to play cards, they can be in there, and, but they have to have the mask on if they're within six feet. Right. Okay, and no snacking at the tables, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's unfortunate that there was confusion. Um, and I think we all received, you know, comments about it. And uh, again, kudos to our team to try to get it back to normal. But, you know, it's it, it's difficult, you know, especially when we're dealing with them all. But uh, so I appreciate the patience of the community as we work through this. Um, and unfortunately, the paper took some information that was just unfortunately very dated by the time we were making decisions, so. Um, um, just yeah, just so everyone knows, I, a little birdie just let me know uh, that the senior centers do close at four in normal normal times, four. not 4.30. Okay, okay uh, anything else for open, uh, Commissioner Frazier? I would like to bring something up. Um, I, I know and that we do not have the authority to tell the school system what to do. They have accept, uh, you know, separately elected board of ed however i did call uh miss herbert uh, about two weeks ago and ask her about their decision for the uh optional mask mandate and um she said basically lacking guidance from the state or from the county they were going to leave it that way and this was two weeks ago things may change because everything else changes but i would be willing to give some guidance and i think as a board of commissioners we might be willing to and what I would like to make the guidance but put out there is that at the very least at this time, the elementary schools, all students and staff should be required to wear a mask because those students cannot get a vaccine because of their age. I don't want to be putting those students into an unsafe environment. I think that we can help mitigate the unsafe environment that may potentially be there by requiring masks. And actually, if you wanted to take it a step further, we may, is maybe the middle schools as well, because it's 12 and under, and most sixth graders are 12 years old. So one third, basically, of the middle schools cannot receive the, the vaccine yet either. So at the very least, in the, the elementary schools, all students and staff should be required to wear a mask and possibly even extend that to the, to the middle schools because of the age. I just, I just want to mitigate an unsafe situation that we may potentially be coming when, when students go back to school. Are you doing this as a regulation? I went back to Commissioner Rothstein's analogy with the military. Um, you know, our guidance are regular. We would recommend, strongly recommend this at this point. Uh, right. not, no laws or that kind. Right, we don't have the, the authority to tell the school system what to do. 
However, we can strongly recommend this. And since Ms. Herbert indicated to me that lacking guidance from the state and or the county, nothing was going to be changed. I would like to give some guidance. If you're all, you know, acceptable to that, I would actually suggest that we send a letter out to the school board today or to, or to the superintendent saying that we, for the elementary schools, and if you agree with the middle schools, that, that all students and staff are required to wear a mask. If you don't agree, that's fine. I want to bring this up so we can have a discussion on it because I don't want to send students into an unsafe situation. We don't have virtual learning right now for Carroll County. Students have to go to school and they should. In-person learning is the best. I don't want it to be a, a decision between getting sick and getting educated. We shouldn't have to, have, parents shouldn't have to make that call. The, um, the State Board of Education is uh, convening at 3 p.m. today. And this is gonna be, I believe, a topic of their discussion. I think there are three jurisdictions that still are out there, Carroll County being one, that do not have mandated masks in the public school system. Um, so- Will this be handled today with the, the State have, Board? What's that? Yeah. Won't this be handled today with the State so, Board of Education? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's going to, they, they called a, uh, a special board meeting uh, today at 3 p.m. Yeah. Um, so so right. that's one. The, but, but let me, the challenge I have is um, it's just a lot of opinions. And like I said, I'm not an expert. I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV. And, um, Although I absolutely agree with you that people should be wearing masks for me to mandate something until somebody says this should be mandated. It's, it's difficult. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, it's hard on me just cause, um, I don't want to be a hypocrite and saying, well, I'm, I'm saying one thing and then I'm acting on something else. Um, and, uh, Although I agree, whatever we can do to provide safeguards for our kids, I think we're obligated to do. And if that means strongly recommending that masks be put in place in the elementary schools, that may be an answer, but um, I don't know how much influence we're gonna have on it. I don't think any, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I'm just I just had that Bertie uh, attacked me here, uh, or talk, call, talk to me, uh, Roberta had a minute ago. Uh, I think the school system said they made their decision that they don't want masks in school uh, at the present time. So I don't, you know, we don't have, they don't have any, got, the governor hasn't made a uh, decision on this. State board hasn't at the present time. Uh, nobody said anything uh, other than letting the board handle it. I'm, um, I agree with you, Ed. I mean, I want to keep everybody safe, especially the ones who can't get vaccinated. However, I think we're going to have to follow on this, the State Board of Education's recommendation on this. Uh, whatever they come up with, uh, they're going to be closer to it than we are. I, well, I don't think, I mean, I think we're as close to Carroll County. I mean, you know, I, no, I, don't think, I don't think it's, I apologize. I, I don't think it's necessary the state having to do this, although the state doing it will then direct the county to do it. But I, I've said it before, nobody knows Carroll County better than Carroll Countyans. The challenge is that the Board of Education made a decision. And the question is, is it an arbitrary decision that they made that discounts the guidance from our health officials like Mr. Singer and others? And if we feel strong enough that that's the case, then we can make a recommendation to the Board of Education that they strongly consider a mask mandate when schools open in the elementary schools. I mean, that's- I mean, I local control, same as you do. I mean, they, they should have that control. Well, it's, okay. First, I don't want to punt to the state board. Right. They make a decision at two o'clock or three o'clock today, and they may not, I don't know what they're going to decide. My feeling is they probably will mandate masks for K to 12. 
but that's up to them. There's no guarantee that will happen. So I don't want to, but I don't want to punt our responsibility over to the state because it's, it doesn't put us in a hot seat basically. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because when I talked to Ms. Herbert, who's the president of the board of ed, she said, lacking guidance from, I'd like to give some guidance. We don't, we can't force them to do this. I'm not, I'm not, I am i am i would not I wouldn't even try, but if they want guidance from Carroll County, we are, we run basically Carroll County. That's what we do as a board of commissioners. Why can't we give them guidance that we believe that masks should be mandated in the elementary schools for all teachers and students, our staff and students, because at the very least, those students coming into the school are not yet eligible for mat for uh, sorry for vaccines. They may be in a while. I don't know what the CDC and all will, will recommend. Hopefully, they will be. And even if they are, it'll probably take about three months or so for the, the, the people that want to be vaccinated to be fully vaccinated at that point. So go ahead, Mr. Boucher. Thank you. I, I just have to realize that this winds up becoming more political than scientific because ultimately this decision needs to be made on hard scientific data. What are we trying to accomplish? Do we have children falling ill and being hospitalized? Is there fatalities? I believe a child is more likely to die in an automobile accident than of COVID. And it's scientifically being proved that the masks are not necessarily working. I believe even Ed Singer in a testimony before the Board of E said that the N95s need to be properly sealed. There's a lot of information out there that needs to be reviewed and analyzed to make this determination. Also, the Board of Education is a separately elected political institution. They have their realm of authority. So there's a lot of data out there that needs to be reviewed and analyzed to determine whether it's necessary to make these measures. And once again, I want to emphasize that COVID is going to be with us until the day we die. So are we going to keep children in masks indefinitely? Are we going to mandate that children get vaccinated when we really are not sure what the ramifications on adolescents are when they're not dying? At, at their, their chances of fatality are very minute. I think it's comparable potentially to flu. Don't quote me on that, but we'd have to find out. We'd have to look at and analyze those numbers. So ultimately, it needs a lot of analyzation and review of the data to back up the decisions, and it belongs to a separate publicly elected institution to make that decision. I think we should back off and allow that process to move forward. I think Commissioner Rothstein alluded to the fact that the state's addressing this today I think it'd be inappropriate for us to try to get in front of that and allow the jurisdictions and the powers that be to make that decision. Oh, so you think it's inappropriate for the commissioners who lead the county to lead? So let so the state. I, I mean, I don't want to go back, back and forth about out of well, item, but I think we, the leaders of the county, I think it's highly appropriate for us to show some guidance, especially when it was asked for from the president of the board of education. Show some guidance. If we don't want to do it, then, then fine. But don't go talking about mask and this and that things. I'm sorry, Commissioner Boucher, that you don't know about. You don't. You make uh, false statements here all the time about COVID. Please stop that. I I think what we, need to say. we need to hear from the Board of Ed, or the President, uh, without making any decisions here. I think uh, maybe some misinterpretations of things happen here so why why don't we do well we don't have much time i i don't think um you know and, and des I, I agree with you i i don't think we need to wait for the state I, I made a fact a statement that the state is convening on special you know a special meeting this afternoon because i saw it in the news um you know there could be expectation of what that's going to happen but i agree with you um that we can give our recommendations to the Board of Education and CCPS when it comes to the elementary schools, because it is our responsibility at looking at the community. You know, it's not our authority, and we know that, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all for crafting something to that effect. I mean, I, I, I agree. Um, and, uh, it's not political. <laughs> it's 
it's kids are getting sick all over this country. And, uh, you know, I just, I don't, it's very difficult. Um, and I don't like it. But kids I, are getting sick. And, um, I don't know, hey, Steve, you got any thoughts on this before I jump in? So, not to correct a colleague, but Dick, you mentioned the governor hasn't weighed in. The governor can't weigh in on it either. I don't know where you're getting the thoughts that he can't. Um, don't put that idea in people's minds because just like at this level, the state can't advise. It's up to the state board of education. Uh, so that that's false. Um, also, with all due respect to my other colleague, Eric, I, I get how you feel about it. But, you know, there's so many for you to make a statement that you think more kids die in auto accidents than in COVID um, is a little bit over the top. You might want to just back off of that a little bit because I, th I think the statistics are rapidly changing um, as a result of what's going on. I think we can strongly recommend whatever the State Board of Education comes up with today and leave it at that. Uh, but to get in these debates about what you should and what you shouldn't and who says what, I mean, that's why we're in this pickle that we're in now. So wh why can't we just strongly recommend that our board uh, go along with what is decided upon this afternoon? Would I like to see a mask on every child in this, in, especially in elementary? Yes, absolutely I would. But I think we need to be mindful uh, of, of those people that can make these decisions uh, and, and ensure that we are following along with that guidance. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. It's very difficult too for a young kid to keep a mask on. I mean, you look at a kid in the garden, they got it up over their ears and uh, on upside down backwards and everything after a couple of hours. It, it is very difficult for these kids. And see, especially that's... the younger, the worse. But you see, Dick, that's, uh, what fuels, that's, what, that's why we're fueling this debate. Because people think kids I can't know. wear masks. I'll, I'll let you talk to my daughter, who's a first grade teacher, and she'll tell you that all of her kids had their masks on So last year. So I, I don't know. I mean, we could debate this till the cows come home. Uh, Private schools are requiring them here uh, locally. So, I mean, they have to have masks. So. Yeah, I mean, I think we should continue to, to use the language of strongly recommending that our colleagues follow the guidance of those uh, organizations or departments that can directly make the, um, the the mandates. So, so Steve, what you know, but that that's kind of I don't disagree, but I think Dennis and I want to speak for you. You're saying why wait for the state? You know, once again, Carroll County knows Carroll County. We should have the ability as the board of commissioners to recommend <clears throat> to the Board of Education and CCPS that elementary school uh, go to masks. Is that regardless of what the state says? Is that what you're saying, Dennis? Yes, it is. So, you know, again, we don't have that authority, but we do, if we feel as a Board of Commissioners have that responsibility to write that letter and provide that recommendation and that's all it is uh and get on the record that we are you know supportive of elementary schools going to full-time masks that's that's it i mean it may it may get circumvented it may change when the state comes out and says everybody goes to masks but you know, regardless. Right. We can only do what we can do. We can only write a letter to recommend it. We can't, the Board of Ed can look at it and say, thank you for recommendation, and they can take it or not. That's up to them. But I so, think we should do yeah. what we can do. So is that your motion to do that? I have a motion that we send a letter to the Board of Ed and the superintendent that uh, we would recommend that all students and staff at elementary schools wear masks. When, when public schools open. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> and indoors. And indoors. Okay. 
I'll second that motion. If I may, I think a decision like this should require us to have the data to show the impact and the viability and positivity of the mask upon our school children. We're making this decision about seeing a scientific analysis and data on it. And I think that what this motion does, it projects the desperation that we, along with many other public institutions in the government, are just desperate that we had masks, we didn't have masks, we had lockdowns, we don't have lockdowns, but it keeps spreading. It goes back to the fact they'll always be here. And just this just projects a desperation of us that we really don't know what we're doing. You know, we did the vaccinations, but vaccinated people are still contracting COVID and it's spreading. So now they want to put us back in masks. We are literally feeling our way through this. So unless there's some hard scientific data that's showing masking our children has a positive benefit and reward, that shouldn't be done because it goes back to something I mentioned earlier. And I think this is what's being forgotten is the psychological impact we are having upon children. Maybe you have never suffered from anxiety. Maybe you have never suffered from depression. Maybe you have never suffered from isolation. But that does not mean that there's not numerous children out there right now who are suffering through this. I have a grandchild that gets tremendous anxiety being in a mask. I have a sister who's a teacher who gets tremendous anxiety being in a mask. And they need a voice out there. And I'm trying to be that voice, that not everyone is the same. So unless we can concrete prove to the public that this mask policy actually has a positive benefit, and outweighs all the negative ramifications we're having upon our children, it needs to be stopped because we still don't know what the long-term psychological impact we are having upon our children. The most basic fundamental building block of human communication is the face. We start masking up children's faces, we're psychologically impacting upon their childhood development, and I find that disturbing. It's an unknown out there. But until we have the information, analyze it, review it, I don't even think it's appropriate to make this decision. I have to say, Eric, the information is out there. All I have to do is look for it and look for it through credible sources. The information is out there. Just because you choose to ignore the information doesn't mean it's out there. And I would rather put a child in a mask than put them in a hospital bed or put them in a casket. And I think that's what it comes down to. And it's uh, uh, that information. You brought in front of us. It's not, uh, I don't feel it's an act of desperation. And, um, you know, it's proven that the vaccines have been effective. It's proven that masks, uh, in, in, in addition with the vaccines, have been effective. Unfortunately, there are no vaccines for these children uh, in these elementary schools. So if we can take one step, just one step in the direction of protecting our children, um, I think it's, you know, incumbent on us to make that recommendation. We don't have that authority, but I can sure voice my opinion. And, you know, uh, after a while, I'm, I'm getting tired of, you know, the, the politics of it. I mean, there's, this is bad. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, then I'll tell you, what, what's frustrating me is I'm, I'm looking at this stupid thing. And there was two suicide bombs in Afghanistan with three Marines that are now hurt. And all I see is this freaking politics about Afghanistan. And I'm like, you know, enough is enough. Let's focus on what matters. And that's the safety and security of our communities. And if I can step up, because I wasn't going to do this with Dennis, but if I can step up and be, be loud enough to say, listen, you know, this may be the right direction to save one more life. And I want to be able to do that. So that's my two cents. I don't have that authority, but I sure can uh, voice my opinion on this. Uh, I agree. Public safety is our, one of our responsibilities, and I call for the question. You what? I'm sorry? Vic? I call for the vote. Okay. Okay, we had a motion. We have a second for writing a letter to recommend that masks be uh, used in elementary schools uh, once the elementary schools open. Any further discussion on this? 
All in favor? Okay, four against, one. Okay, four, one motion carries. Roberta, please uh, work with um, the team and uh, Chris in getting that letter um, drafted uh, relatively sooner than later. Um, and then we'll take it from there, okay? Thank you so much. Okay. If I may, I have one, one further yeah, issue please. I just want to clarify. Where are we with the amusement tax and fire uh, departments? Uh, so we um, have drafted a potential resolution and um, sent that to the state um, comptroller's office, the office of that office that deals with that for review. And it's been there mm, a couple weeks now, a um, week and a half at least. So uh, we're just waiting for them to get it back to us. Okay. so. Fire departments will not have to pay that. Is that correct? They don't have to pay it now um, unless they okay. use a profit sharing method. So this would just change that one okay. aspect. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else? And uh, I was going to add an open admin about what I just read about Afghanistan. Um, there is so far two suicide bombings, both in Kabul, one outside the gate and one by a hotel, both areas that I know, unfortunately, too well, and pretty horrific if anybody's ever seen something like this. Um, so let's just keep our thoughts, prayers, however, for strength and courage to all those engaged. Um, I think we're done with uh, public comment, open admin, appreciate the spirit. Let's go to agendas. Uh, Wanda, are you on? Yes. All Good right. morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Monday, August 30th, nothing. Tuesday, nothing. Wednesday, Commissioner Wance will be at the Planning Commission at 6 p.m. On Thursday, we go into closed at 8, and then we open at 9. Uh, my expectations, it will not be virtual. It should be uh, in person. Uh, we'll start with some proclamations, and then we have uh, a renewal for some software, Adobe software. Uh, Mr. Ripper is still going to be with us talking about network replacement on the EOC. Um, Request approval to award term contract uh, electric door maintenance. Um, yes, yeah, some DPW uh, purchase of a Bobcat, purchase of a 2022 Ford 350. I'm sure we'll fill up from there. Uh, and then Friday, nothing, Saturday, nothing. And I have the luxury of the podcast on September 5th, Labor Day weekend. And Labor Day weekend, uh, Monday is Labor Day. I expect we will be off and we will uh, ensure that the public knows that. So there'll be a, a press release sharing that uh, that Monday we will not be in Tuesday, nothing, Wednesday, nothing, Thursday, closed open. <clears throat> uh, we're going to talk about option to purchase the Huff. Uh, and Muse Properties through our Ag Preservation Program, which is awesome. Uh, and that's all we have. <laughs> I expect that'll fill up. Um, and then we're going to go into closed on that day for land acquisition. Um, Commissioner Wance will be attending the on Friday, uh, Friday morning, the VFW um, business breakfast in Tawny Town. The Toy Town Business Breakfast. I apologize, Commissioner Wentz will be attending, and then he'll have a, a walking tour of Tawny Town. Two Wences are better than one. A grand that, opening that, case that, just, just, yeah. Commissioner just for the record, for the record, the, the, the location of that Tawny Town Business Breakfast is wrong. It's not oh. at the Westminster VFW. It's at the Thunderhead Bowling Center in Tawny Town. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> On Saturday, uh, CC Visa 
hosts the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And it'll be the Public Safety Training Center uh, where Commissioner Wance and Weaver will join me for that solemn ceremony. Can you add my name to that, please? Okay. And I'll be at the VFW that day speaking. I'm not, I'm not there yet. At 12.30, Remembrance Day, Commissioner Weaver will be speaking at the VFW. And then at 4.30 p.m. Uh, will be the Pleasant Valley Community Fire 90th Anniversary Banquet, and I expect Commissioner Wance will be attending that. Is that correct? Correct. I'm not, I'm not correct. sure. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Wentz has the podcast, which I'm looking forward to on Sunday the 12th. And out of the darkness walk at Crimgold Park at 10 in the morning. Is that Commissioner Boucher? Are you attending that? Yep. Commissioner Boucher will be attending that uh, on Sunday the 12th. I would like you to add my name to that as well and put it on my calendar. Along with Commissioner Frazier, he'll be wearing his knee braces, but he'll be going on the walk. Okay. Is there anything else before we, before I request uh, us to adjourn to go into closed for land acquisition? Um, Commissioner Frazier, it's a walk, not a bike, bike ride. Don't bring your bike. Okay. I need a motion to adjourn for the day and go into closed or however you want to say it. Oh, Roberta? Yeah, two separate motions, one to um, go into close for land acquisition, please, and then one to recess. What she said. Motion to go into close for land acquisition. Second. Okay, all in favor? And then motion, motion to adjourn after close. Second. Okay, all in favor? I'm impressed, 5-0. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.